if you want to talk about Hans. Well, no, we, we we could. We could say how great he was, but we, we're going to do something special for him. But I think we're live now. Hey, everyone, mm-hmm. and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to the true uh, to the true cause, to amazing people who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. Well, today is the first Monday of the month, which means it's time for McDougal Monday with John, Dr. John, and Mary McDougal. And today, Dr. McDougal will be talking about Alzheimer's disease and if aluminum is the true cause. True cause. I can't speak today. It's Monday. Please welcome Dr. McDougal back to the show. How have hey. you been, Dr. McDougal? Hey, I got my... Got my be excited, do your best shirt on today. So Dr. McDougal, that shirt looks so good on you. And if anybody wants to know how to get them, they are hand painted by my friend Julie before I left the desert. Let me just show you some of her work. Each one, each one is completely original and they are amazing. And she makes dresses and I'll put you in touch with her. We should probably have her on the show, but she is my favorite artist. And I feel that something that's a one of a kind like you, Dr. McDougal needs a one of a kind shirt. Oh, you know, I, I feel so proud when I wear this shirt because, you know, it's 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 an original, to say the least. Yeah, no one else yeah, has. Thank that you, shirt. thank you, thank you for the gift, AJ. I'd like to yeah. get, I'd like to get some more shirts from her. Maybe married like a dress. Oh, Doctor McDougal, wait a second! You're going to be in the desert where this artist yeah. lives and works. Why don't we oh. just go to her booth? If you have a couple out, please come with me a couple hours on Sunday morning. We can go to her booth. I'm going anyway. I'm going to, I'm going to be there. So, which it's just, I'd like to tell people about it. I'm, I'm going to be getting an award September, I believe it's the 10th or 11th at the plantrician conference in Palm Desert, Palm Springs, someplace, some Palm place in California with the JW Marriott Hotel, JW Marriott Hotel. I'll be giving a, a something called a luminary award, which I think is pretty important. I think they're going to say some good things about the work that I've done over the years. And this is a group, Plantrician is a group of uh, physicians and other healthcare providers who are interested in plants as an approach to health. And so I'll be uh, receiving an award from them and I'm not going to miss it. And any of you that uh, have an interest in having a great weekend, think about it. It's the Plantrician Conference, P-L-A-N-T-R-I-C-I-A-N, Plantrician, Scott Stoll's uh, group. Uh, a, lot, a lot of my friends, a lot of people who speak similar, you know, some people are, um, you know, just getting started on the transition from standard medical therapy to getting at the cause of problems and really helping people. So it should be exciting for you. Uh, don't don't miss the opportunity if it's something you can avail yourself to. And then stop by and say hello to Heather and I. And Are you going to be there, AJ? I'm going to be there. I'm actually presenting on Friday. They're letting yeah. me stay the whole week. I'm going to be there. Esther and Ben Loveridge are going to be there. We wouldn't miss it for the world. That's right. I remember. I saw, I saw you you on the schedule. That's great. Yeah. And we did a show with Scott, with Dr. Scott Stoll, just to give people uh, the discount. The discount is not still good, but you should, people, guys, go. It's a fantastic conference and the food is incredible and the speakers are incredible. Yeah, I, I, can, I can tell you that I've been to the con. I've been a speaker there at least once, if not twice. And uh, yeah, you don't, you don't want to miss it. There are just so few opportunities where you get together with like-minded people, you know, people who are interested in cure fixing the problem, which is the the food, it's the diet. And uh, these rare occasions, I wish they'd become more popular and they may, they may, but of course you gotta get a hold of the money. That's the problem is the money. Anyway, uh, for those few of you I haven't had a chance to meet, I'm uh, my name's John McDougall. I've um, been in the practice of medicine for more than a half a century. And I love being a doctor. I'm the luckiest doctor in the world. I didn't always feel that way. Uh, When I was given tools uh, that focused around medications and surgeries and devices and so on, you know, I thought I was a pretty lousy doctor because the outcome was not good. You know, the patient stayed just as sick. And you know this, you know, it happened to your your spouse and your mom, your dad, your kids, whatever. You, You went in for the cure. And what you got is a bag full of drugs and a bunch of excuses. I, that, that's not what you wanted. And, you know, that's not what your doctor wanted for you either. Your doctor would love to do what he or she thought they were going to be able to do when they took on the career of being a medical doctor. They thought they could make people's lives better, reduce their suffering. But unfortunately, uh, this is a business. 
And until you start thinking of a business, you're going to be susceptible to, to profits. You know, you're, you're going to be driven by profits, period. Plain and simple, how you get cared for depends upon how money, much money the uh, medical business as it's set up today can make. And that's what drives all of it. I've uh, given you lectures on cancer and heart disease and diabetes treatments, et cetera. And I've tried to show you that, you know, not, not, in, a, not in a mean way or, or to distort what's going on. I, I try just try and share with you why things are the way they are. Why am I not being given the, the treatment that cures you know, why instead of my ass to go through heart surgery, which, by the way, you know, I, I show you 12 different studies, all the studies, they're all the studies. Now, I mean, they didn't leave any out to show the results of doing angioplasty, uh, percutaneous uh, coronary interventions, PCIs, they call them, where they stick a catheter in your heart and they squash your plaques. All the studies show the same thing. There's no survival advantage. And, you know, when you spend hundreds of millions of dollars to try and prove what you're doing works and it comes out negative every time, you'd think they'd stop, but they don't because that's the only tool they got. So that's where they make the big bucks. So they do everything they can to justify it. And I have a subject for you today, which focuses the same thing. If you're not interested in the treatment of Alzheimer's disease, so be it. Just, just look at what I'm telling you. I'm telling you about the current therapies and about why they're being done and what the results are and what alternative you have. And think about it for a minute. Tell me, is there any other way to explain this besides profit outweighs patience? I want you to answer that when I'm done. Tell me, is there another excuse? Am I missing something? No, I don't think so, but I'm certainly open for an education. You know, I, I'd like to feel real good about what's being done in the name of being a medical doctor. Yeah. Now, I, 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 as you say, I love the profession. I love being a doctor and I love the kind of practice I have because, you know, it's kind of unique in the sense that it's not oriented towards profit. Yeah, we make, we got to make a living, of course. I got to, you know, pay the bills and, you know, buy, buy, buy a few fun things in life. And, and I do, I don't deprive myself, but you know, I can make a lot more money <laughs> being a heart surgeon. I'd have been a terrible heart surgeon, though. It's because that's not my that's not my skill. I I don't have a skill of of, of a carpenter of a of somebody who's involved in hammers and nails and knives and pliers and things like that. I, I don't have that kind of skill. So fortunately for you and for me, I didn't go into the surgery the business of surgery. I, instead, I was able to think and talk and write. And that's what I ended up doing for the last half century. But anyway, uh, that's kind of the lead up to what I'm going to talk to you about today, which is Alzheimer's disease. And tell me what you think. You know, tell me if you think it's fair or not fair. But this applies to, to pretty much everything. So if I could have uh, control there. Yeah, I, I did it. And by the way, uh, we, everybody's saying how much they love your beard, Dr. McDougal. All right. Yeah. Well, you know, I've gotten such positive responses from everybody. Uh, I, I've grown a beard several times in my life. Uh, I did it once when I first started as a sugar plantation doctor on the Big Island of Hawaii. I did it because I was 25 years old and I looked like a child. You know, and, and I didn't think people would have much respect for me because of how I appeared. I appeared like a high school student. So what I did is I grew a beard at that time, kept it for oh, probably two or three years, at least three years. I kept it when I went back uh, after my three years as a sugar plantation doctor. When I went back into my medical residency, because I just didn't care, you know, I was there to do an awful lot of work. I used to work, we, we, I would work, and I'm sure there are other people in the medical business that can attest to what I'm going to tell you. I would go into work uh, one morning, and I'd get to come home maybe, maybe the next day after work. But to me, I have to wait for 48 hours, but working straight at, at for 48 hours, seeing patients, sometimes 12 a day I'd have to take care of. I just wanted to get through it. It was brutal training, but I had to have it because I have to know everything the other guys know. And that's one thing I pride myself on is you know, I'll be glad to sit down and talk to a cardiologist. 
or in this case, a neurologist or an oncologist. And we'll talk about your business because I know your business. I know it pretty darn well, at least enough to, to bring forth an argument where people would question what you're doing. So there's the challenge. Anybody that's out there that happens to know a well-meaning doctor who thinks they're he or she are so smart. And that Dr. McDougal is just a health food nut pushing berries. Hey, Chef AJ, sit him down next to me at the table. You've been in that situation, AJ, where I've had a chance to talk to experts in various fields, and I can hold my own. Absolutely. Anyway, what, what, what is being done is wrong. But, you know, I've spent a life trying to make it right, a lifetime trying to make it right. And I think with the help of Chef AJ and many of my colleagues, uh, we've made a big dent in the business. And I hope we've helped them as far as their their profitability can, is concerned. We just got to find some way doing the right thing can make more money than doing the wrong thing. That's the secret. All right. Well, let's uh, let's talk about Alzheimer's disease, which is the leading cause of dementia, which of course people fear uh, uh, as much as dying. They don't don't want to sit in a wheelchair and drool and uh, not be able to carry on conversations or know what time or place you're at. You know, that's that's what we're facing. It's becoming demented as life goes on. And of people who suffer from dementia, which is all too common, somewhere between 60 and 80% of this dementia is due to Alzheimer's, which is what we're going to talk about. There's other causes of of dementia, such as um, alcohol and uh, small strokes and some other toxicities that people can run into, but 60 to 80% is due to what I'm going to talk to you about now. So how do you diagnose uh, Alzheimer's disease? You do it based uh, primarily on history. You can uh, get some uh, added information by doing sophisticated testing, such as CAT scans and MRIs and PET scans and perfusion scans of all kinds, but really to to diagnose it in the live state, in the dead state, you can you can make the definitive diagnosis. We'll talk about that in a minute. But uh, when you're alive and walking around to make the diagnosis, the doctor has to look, kind of listen to you, give you a few tests, realize that you're becoming demented quite quickly and put together a little bit of your family history, et cetera. And then come to the conclusion, this is probably Alzheimer's disease, but how do you really diagnose it? You can't diagnose it until you have brain tissue. So you're gonna do a brain biopsy, which is not something routinely done, or on autopsy, somebody's gonna take a sliver of your brain tissue and put it under a microscope and you're gonna be able to make the diagnosis that way because Alzheimer's has some very characteristic lesions seen under the microscope. They're called pathognomonic lesions. And there there are certain things I'm going to ask you to pay particular attention to as I go through this presentation. So that's the way you make the diagnosis is definitively you have to look at a piece of brain tissue. But you get a pretty good idea just by, you know, your clinical examination, history, et cetera. What I want to talk to you about is the new highly profitable treatment of Alzheimer's disease using amyloid clearing monoclonal antibodies. So in the laboratory, the the scientists are able to create antibodies that attack certain proteins. In this case, they would be proteins of the, the monoclonal antibodies that are attacking amyloid proteins, beta amyloid. And uh, so they make these antibodies against this particular protein that's present in the brain. And as a a result, the the antibodies are supposed to clear the brain of these proteins, the the amyloid. All right, well, that's well and good, except, you know, these kinds of of things that they're trying to clear, proteins that they're trying to clear are the result of inflammation and damage. They're not the cause. These drugs are never, never sold as the cause or, or the cure. They're never sold as the cure. It's never claimed that the that the uh, beta amyloid, the, the protein that we're going to talk about, the neurofibrotangles, and they, they they never talk about that being 
the cause. But they, the idea is, is if they go in and clean up the debris from the damage, that somehow they're going to improve the clinical outcome for the patients. And so they've invented these medications. And uh, as mentioned, uh, the antibodies are to mop up a protein called beta amyloid. Now, I'll show you beta amyloid in a minute, so it won't be confusing. But let's, let's talk about the onset of these medications over the last couple of months. In fact, last month, most of this occurred, at least as far as the public's attention. July 6, 2023, the FDA approved Loquimbi. Loquimbi is the first of the monoclonal antibodies that uh, came to market for, for the treatment of Alzheimer's disease. And what they showed, and I want you to keep these figures in mind, they showed over a period of 12 to 18 months, in this case, it was 18 months, what they showed was a 27% reduction in progression of the disease based upon clinical outcomes. So they took a bunch of people who had Alzheimer's disease, a, a certain degree of Alzheimer's disease that was similar, and they divided them into two groups. One group did not get the monoclonal antibodies. The other group did. And then they followed the course, like in this particular study, they followed the course over 18 months. And they tried to see based upon people's ability to function, uh, take care of themselves. Uh, the, as much dementia as, they, dementia as they developed was assessed and compared to those who didn't get the treatment. 27% reduction. 27% okay. reduction. Keep that in mind. 27% reduction, 18 months it took. You had to get an injection once or twice a week. In some of the therapies now, it's one injection every four weeks. The cost annually is uh, twenty, about $25,000. But the real hooker is here. In addition to only having a 27% reduction in progression of disease based upon looking at the patients, that's how they tell. Not by doing any biopsies or any blood tests. You look at the patient and see what happens to those who are given the therapy, the intervention group. And uh, what they found is, like I say, a, a minimal, minimal benefit. Never claiming that this treatment was to deal with the problem as if they were going to get a cure. And, and then it, we, what we find is that this is a dangerous therapy. You know, they give these intravenous check-ins, uh, like I say, uh, up to twice a week or, or every four weeks. And they have to do MRIs on the patients. And they do it for like... Uh, they do three MRIs over the first six months of therapy. And what they find is that in Laquimbi, for example, 20% of the people show brain swelling and or bleeding. And some people die as, as a consequence of uh, this particular infusion and the inflammation that takes place, 20%. And, and the newer drug that was just, just uh, the study was published on it, it's uh, Donan, Imab, I probably have that pronunciation wrong. MAB stands for monoclonal antibody. That's what the end of each of these uh, particular names refers to, is MAB is the monoclonal antibody. So um, in the study that was just published July of 2023, uh, they, they used another more powerful, more directed antibody, the uh, Donani Mob. Uh, again, you can criticize me on the publication or the pronunciation. So they saw at best a four month delay in progression. And over 18 months, there was a 36% decline in progression. All right, 27, 36%. Keep those numbers in mind. Cost, similar, $28,000 a year. But in this case, 37% of the people treated had problems that they refer to as amyloid related imaging abnormalities. In other words, brain damage swelling, bleeding of the brain from the drug. The criticism is, and it should be from a scientific point of view, is that the, the amyloid, the, which we're going to talk about, you're going to know what the amyloid is, the fibrous tissue, is really a minor issue when it comes to the cause and progression of this disease. So let's, let's just summarize here. Uh, current therapies, very popular, very controversial among scientists and doctors. Uh, extremely expensive, extremely toxic, with extremely little benefit. And that's what you're being sold. But you're desperate. You know, you're, you're with a loved one who's deteriorating right in front of your eyes. You want to do something. And besides that, 
you know, with the FDA approval, the, the drug companies and Medicare, et cetera, are likely to pay for this treatment. All right, you're going to keep that in mind as we talk about the cause of Alzheimer's disease. And what I would like to have, if I had this problem, how I'd like to be treated, and how I've treated my patients for the last 40 years who have Alzheimer's disease. Uh, Lewis Alzheimer discovered this disease in 1901. And of course, that's where the name comes from, is Lewis Alzheimer. What he did is he noticed a, a, a patient who had rapid progression of dementia, more rapid than you expect to see. It was in 1901, and he looked at the brain of this patient, after the patient died, of course, looked at the brain under the microscopes they had in those days. And what they found is a particularly severe kind of lesion. Uh, they're called plaques and neural fibro tangles. And the amyloid is part of the neural fibro tangle. It's also referred to as, as tau protein. So anyway, the first case was described in 1901 in a woman who had rapidly progressive dementia. By 1926, there were only 36 cases reported in the world literature. Uh, they started using aluminum uh, during World War II. Prior to that, aluminum was not uh, something that was available in pots and pans or pretty much any place. Uh, it was too expensive to make and you know, uh, they didn't find any really good utilities for it. But with World War II, airplanes and war machines and so on, aluminum became of age. And so it was distributed throughout populations, uh, populations primarily in the Western world. And uh, after World War II, the incidence of Alzheimer's disease increased to 26 million people. Uh, today, you know, these days, what it's estimated is uh, 5.7 million Americans of all ages have Alzheimer's disease. So what are there, 33, 330 million Americans? And we're talking about 5.7% of them having a pretty serious disease, 5.7 million. All right, by 2025, which is right around the corner, uh, the number of people with Alzheimer's disease over the age of 65 is gonna be 7.1 million. So it, it's, it's a very common, it's an everyday problem, something you'll notice in your family. And the progression of the disease correlates specifically with the utilization of a non-nutrient, a heavy metal called aluminum. And in parts of the world where aluminum was used extensively, like the Western societies, Europe, the United States, the incidence of Alzheimer's disease has become, been up until recently, more common in Western countries. Again, I think it's most related to the aluminum, but it's part related to the diet. In Western countries, as opposed to, for example, in Asia, it's only become a, a real problem in China, Thailand, Vietnam, et cetera, over the last couple of decades. This is the pathognomonic lesion that Lewis Alzheimer's saw under his microscope and what all scientists would see to make the diagnosis. Pathognomonic means that if you see this lesion, these senile plaques, you see the amyloid, it's called the amyloid plaque there. You see the neurofibro tangles. If you see this under a microscope, you go, that's Alzheimer's. And if the brain tissue doesn't have these lesions, it's not Alzheimer's, okay? So that's how you make the diagnosis. And you see that uh, uh, the neurofibro tangles, which are also called tau protein, which is, the amyloid material, which is what, what these drugs are trying to attack. They're trying to remove, remove the garbage, the, the products of, uh, the byproducts of inflammation and injury is what they take away from, thinking somehow that they're gonna correct the underlying disease and the progression. All right, let me take you back to the microscope. Here you are, you've got your microscope out on your laboratory table. You're, you're looking at the slices of brains of your favorite relative and you see, you see the neurofibril tangles, you know, the, the, the beta amyloid, which is what the drugs are attacking. You, you see them and you say, aha, this, my, my relatives have Alzheimer's disease. And then you go back to the research to try and get an idea of how they got these pathognomonic lesions. All right. Uh, th there, are, there are microtubules that are, are, are forming the inside structure of a neuron. 
And these microtubules, they get attacked and damaged. And they result in what we call tau proteins. Anyway, so you say, well, maybe I could get a clue as to what caused these lesions, these pathognomonic lesions. So you bring out some more technology. And in this case, you bring out uh, nuclear magnetic resonance techniques. Big, big, sophisticated, sexy term, right? And you start peering into the amyloid plaques and into the neurofibril tangles. And what you find, lo and behold, is the central core of the amyloid plaque is made up of aluminum silicate. Okay, okay. So let's let's follow this backwards. So you uh, you find that these plaques contain aluminum silicate, and, and you wouldn't have a plaque without the aluminum silicate. And if you don't have a plaque, you don't have the disease. I mean, how much stronger correlation could you get with aluminum than finding this culprit right there in your under your microscope? You got it right there, aluminum silicate. All right, we're going to be talking about aluminum. And by the way, you can look up all the research on this, or some of the more important research that I thought was 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 important for you to understand and and uh, examine further. And to, as I as I told you many times, to find out whether Dr. McDougall is exaggerating or maybe has the information incorrect. Check me on it. Here's the research on the bottom right hand corner. Okay, so um, you're with me so far. You've got to have aluminum silicate uh, to have a plaque. You've got to have these pathognomonic lesions, the senile plaques, the neurofibril tangles, the beta amyloid uh, tau proteins. So you call them what you want. It doesn't make any difference. The antibodies are made to trying to clean up the garbage left after the inflammation. You're with me. And the benefit, and the benefit of the present approach is uh, that you have a approximately a 30% reduction in progression of disease compared to controls at a cost of $25,000 a year and at the risk of having brain damage 20 to 40% of the time. And having to go get an MRI three times during the first six months of therapy, having to go to the doctor to get an infusion, you know, they put this through your vein, you know, twice a week or once every four weeks, that's what you have to do. You'd expect a big bang for the Brock Buck, wouldn't you? Well, what you end up is you end up with a tremendous amount of controversy. And you can read about this. Uh, doctors, scientists who were interested in, in the patients and their families said, this is ridiculous. This is dangerous. This shouldn't be, this shouldn't be put on to the public. But hey, they got the money. So they're going to hire the spin doctors. They're going to hire the lobbyists. They're going to get it passed through the FDA, for example and make this available to the public. And the public's gonna say, well, at least there's something to help. All right, Alzheimer's disease. Let's take a look at some of the evidence that I've, I've told you a bit about this, but let, let's review it a little bit. Uh, as far as uh, the connection to the Western diet, what we find is Asians have um, many fewer cases of Alzheimer's disease compared to Europeans. As far as comparing Japanese Americans to native Japanese, the incidence of Alzheimer's disease is much higher in uh, American Japanese people as opposed to people who were raised in Japan. The same thing with Africa. You find that in, uh, in the United States, black people have two to three times the risk of having Alzheimer's disease compared to say, black people who are from Africa say live in rural or even modern Africa, uh, people with high cholesterol levels, people with atherosclerosis, in other words, have history of heart attacks and strokes, they have a higher incidence of Alzheimer's disease. And there are animal experiments that confirm the relationship between Alzheimer's and the Western diet. In fact, there's even research that says if you would put people on statins, they would benefit as far as their Alzheimer's disease is concerned. Let me, let me summarize what I think is going on. First of all, you're talking about societies where aluminum is more prevalent. You know, Europe, United States, as compared to Asian countries. That's probably most of it. But there's also the fact that, you know, people in the United States and in Europe, they eat a horrible diet. So 
you know, they have problems with their bowel integrity, integrity problems with their immune system, et cetera. So if you're going to eat the Western diet based on meat and dairy products, you're going to be susceptible to more susceptible to any toxin in the environment. So does, does Alzheimer's have a connection with the Western diet? Yeah, it does. Yeah, it does. Maybe a direct connection. Maybe an indirect connection. Direct being that you're weakened people when you eat the Western diet. More direct being the fact that there's more aluminum in the environment of people who live in Western societies. Okay, you're up with me on that discussion so far. In other words, it fits the epidemiologic evidence worldwide. All right, so let's talk about the aluminum, which you have to have. Okay, come on now, you have to have it to have the senile plaque. You have to have the senile plaque to diagnose Alzheimer's. So let's talk about the aluminum. Uh, aluminum is not a nutrient. In other words, you have no requirement for it, like you do for copper, or iron. Uh, there's no requirement for aluminum. It's a known toxin. Uh, we particularly saw this when we were alumin using aluminum hydroxide in the treatment of kidney patients. It's part of the therapy when somebody gets on dialysis. You put them on these aluminum compounds to reduce the, I believe it's the phosphorus in the patient's system. And what we found is a dementia that looked just like Alzheimer's disease in these people on dialysis that were getting, getting as part of their treatment, these aluminum compounds. Uh, 1973, brains of Alzheimer's disease, they did, uh, uh, well, let me show you, let me explain how they did the experiment. They, they took brains of people who say died of stroke, uh, and they took another bunch of brains of people who died of Alzheimer's, and they ground them up, and they analyzed the aluminum content in the different brains, and they found that those who had Alzheimer's had a much higher aluminum content in the ground up brains, 1937. Uh, they've exposed animals. I know, I know you don't like to see animal experimentation. I can sympathize with what you're through your cause. And, but it's, it's valuable information to see what, what happens in animal studies. And I don't discount it. You know, I have some feelings about it one way or the other. So you expose animals to a, a, aluminum and they develop, uh, they develop pathogenic lesions. They develop senile plaques, amyloid plaques, neurofibril tangles, tau proteins, all the terminology that you hear that you see in the human. And we also have experiments, many experiments that are done that look at the aluminum content of drinking water in various communities. And those who have a high aluminum content have a higher risk of Alzheimer's disease, uh, as much as you know three times the risk. So uh, as you get older, your gut is, uh, is more permeable to aluminum. And that may be one of the reasons that it becomes more common as people get older. It's a disease of older people, even though it does occur in younger people. And then we're gonna have a more definitive way of looking at this, which is in terms of a cure. Remember your monoclonal antibodies were, are never being sold as a cure. But what I'm gonna tell you about, I interpret as a cure of Alzheimer's disease, not a reversal. The damage that's been done is done. It's not reversed. But what you can do is you can dramatically slow the progression of the disease, which at best, these monoclonal antibody treatments, they cost you $25,000 a year, give you brain damage 20 to 40% of the time. You know, that's not a cure. So let's go on to more definitive evidence as to the involvement of aluminum. Uh, where does aluminum come from? Well, it's prevalent in our society. And where we eat aluminum most commonly is on our processed food products. For example, uh, sour cream preparations have high loads, high aluminum content, uh, processed cheeses, pancake mixes, baking powders. You know, there's some baking powders that have aluminum. There are other kinds of baking powders that don't. And you compare the aluminum content, which is in the box on the upper left-hand side of these prepared and packaged foods, the amount of aluminum that would be in natural whole foods. You can see the dramatic difference. Okay, the, the next source that comes from your food has to do with how you prepare your meals. Here on the bottom left-hand corner, you look at the box there and you see that the aluminum content of applesauce uncooked, not much, but if you cook the applesauce in an aluminum pot, guess what? You increase the aluminum by like 21 times. You cook it in a stainless steel pot, you don't increase the aluminum content. So cooking, and the kind of cookware you choose 
can make a huge difference. Look at tomato sauce, 570 times increase in aluminum content in the resulting tomato sauce if you cook it in an aluminum pot. Yeah. There are certain medications like Citricel uh, contains uh, aluminum. I'm sorry, Citricel uh, will increase aluminum absorption. Okay, Citricel does not contain aluminum. But if you take antacids that have citrate in them, you increase the absorption of aluminum from other sources by eight to 11 times. All right, there's also aluminum in teas. And those who uh, are a little bit sophisticated and will try and defend their own particular habits and talk against what I was trying to tell you, will point out that tea also has a lot of aluminum in it, but it doesn't cause Alzheimer's disease. It's because the aluminum is complex in the plant substances, so it's not absorbed. It's not absorbed. All right. So that's, that's where you get the aluminum from. But it's not the more serious source of aluminum. Uh, what we discovered back in the 1940s when we started doing autopsies on people who had Alzheimer's disease is that when you looked at the brains, you found those with the most serious dementia had these pathognomonic lesions. Remember, neurofibril tangles, senile plaques, amyloid, tau proteins. Come on now, we've talked about all that. It's right there in the center. What they found is you found more of these senile plaques with the most severe disease. The senile plaques are present in the greatest density in the olfactory lobe of the brain. Okay, you see the brain down here in the center bottom. The brain has an extension. It's not a nerve. It's part of the brain. It has a stalk called the olfactory lobe. And the olfactory lobe goes from the center of the brain uh, to the nose. And uh, it nerves poke through the top of the nose uh, into the nasal cavity. And it's through this portal that you get the most aluminum and the most disease. It's through the nose, not through the gastrointestinal tract. You get, you know, you're able to sort it through the GI tract, but it's through the nose. And where they discovered this first was industrial workers. Like for example, those people who worked at making brake linings, they had to work with aluminum compounds. And they're the ones that had the lesions in the nose, in the olfactory lobe, that uh, also had the most severe dementia. All right. Well, uh, that probably wasn't very important until about 20 years ago, it became popular to recommend to people that they stop perspiring. And so antiperspirants came on the market. These are different than deodorants. Deodorants just cover up odor. Antiperspirants make you stop sweating. All antiperspirants are made of aluminum compounds, aluminum chloride. Oh, so what happens and what the most common portal of entry is now is every morning, a good share of our population takes and sprays aluminum into their nose as they douse their armpits to stop themselves from sweating. Now, as a consequence of this becoming a popular notion that these, um, these antiperspirants are a likely serious problem when it comes to the development of Alzheimer's disease, they basically went off the market. You know, they, they sold antiperspirants with, as uh, roll-ons and lotions and so on, but no more aerosols. And that stopped for quite a while until now. If you look at Amazon, you look at uh, wherever you buy your antiperspirants and your duodens, what you'll find is they're back on the market. So every day you spray this huge dose of aluminum into your nose which is the most serious portal of entry, which results in the most serious dementia. All right, now let's talk about the causal relationship. I think I've established for you pretty well. And if I haven't, you can just do the reading. It's overwhelming. But of course, we're dealing with the aluminum industry. The aluminum industry, which of course you're dealing with the fluoride industry because aluminum comes out of the ground as aluminum fluoride. So you're dealing with two big industries here. And there's a great amount of money at risk. And so they have their spin doctors who go out and try and convince you that aluminum is totally incidental. It has no big role to play and certainly not causative. 
And that's why you have monoclonal antibody. Treatments are popular these days is because the aluminum industry is very happy about this because it's taken the guilty light off of the aluminum. All right, so um, studies done. And I want you to remember the monoclonal antibodies, they gave a decrease in progression of disease between 27 and 36%. All right, a two-year trial of 63 patients. This is a randomized control trial. Okay, the ultimate in science. Those who got this treatment, this treatment is an aluminum chelator, which removes aluminum from the body. They were in twice as good a shape as those who were in the control group. All right, so what is that? That's 100% reduction. I don't know how you do these percentages. 27%, you don't call it a 50%. Anyway, they, they did twice as well. Uh, much better than you ever did with the monoclonal antibodies. And uh, this kind of therapy is pretty much non-toxic. It's been proven to remove aluminum from the brain and the body. Cheap, that's the problem. It's, it's not a brand name drug. It's generic, it, you know, it costs pennies. The, the excuse doctors give for why they haven't used this, this chelating agent called deferoxamine is they say, well, it's just too painful. Excuse me, it's just too painful? Yeah, to get a shot in your muscles once or twice a day. That's just too mask ask for a patient to, to do. Whereas we can have them go for three MRIs during the first six months of therapy. We can have them to suffer brain swelling, brain bleeding, and possibly die at a rate of uh, 20 to 30% of the people treated. We can ask them to do that, but it's too much to ask them to have a shot. We can ask them to go into the doctor's office and have an infusion, you know, twice a week, once every four weeks. We can do that, but we can't give them a shot. Dysphroxamine, dysphroxamine. This has been extensively studied. Safe, inexpensive, available. And what it does is it works. I just wrote a letter to the editor and hopefully it's gonna appear within the next two or three weeks in the Journal of the American Medical Association. They just published a big study on one of the MAB drugs, monoclonal antibody drugs. I showed you the results. You can go look back in the slides. I'll look at them with you again. And uh, I wrote him a letter, a letter to the editor. And I'm just gonna tell you the summary of it. It explains the drawbacks of these MAB, the monoclonal antibody drugs. Now, same data that I, I just gave you in the first slide. And then I explained to them about deferoxamine. And then what I ask is, why haven't we done studies? Rightly, there's only 30, 63 patients here, but it was a randomized control trial, which is the highest in science. Why haven't we invested the money to use this therapy to prove it works or doesn't work? This is a cure. This is a cure. This doesn't mean you're gonna reverse the damage. You're gonna be just as demented but the progression of the disease will stop or slow at a far greater rate than the monoclonal antibodies can cause. Uh, there are a couple other derivatives uh, of this defroxamine that you'll also find there. You know, I, my one hope is that they'll develop a chelating agent similar to defroxamine that will be patentable so that they can put out the message, they can educate the population that aluminum poisoning is the cause of Alzheimer's. It's due to aluminum poisoning. Did I say that clear enough? Did I hesitate at all? All right. So what can you do right now if you believe what I say? You're not gonna go down and get defroxamine shots. Unless you have the disease, you might go looking for it. You might talk to you know, you might talk to some of your uh, healthcare providers and ask them to take the trouble to get defroxamine for you. And you can take it home and inject it in your muscles yourself. But you can also do this. You can also take in silica. Now, silica is an organic compound, okay? It's not silicon. If you see down in the bottom left-hand corner, silicon is an element. Silica is a compound. You know, it's, uh, it's made of silica, but it's a compound. It's found in the earth, 
and it's found in plants. And you can buy silica in various kinds of silica-laced waters. Uh, living silica is one of them. Fiji water is another one. There are dozens of them out there. And the amount of silica provided is 86 milligrams per liter. All right, this is, I don't know how many of my bottle is, what is 500 milliliters. So uh, you can drink one of these bottles and you take in, you take in uh, 43 milligrams of silica. 10 milligrams a day of silica is associated with a reduced risk of Alzheimer's. So in other words, what you'd have to consume is a quarter bottle of water a day to remove enough aluminum from your body using silica to make a difference as far as your risk of developing Alzheimer's. Pretty cheap, pretty non-toxic, pretty profitable for Fiji waters and similar ones. But there are also teas. The teas that contain silica, they're sold as tinctures and capsules. A couple of the teas that I noticed that uh, were high in silica, and you'll find others, are uh, horsetail and bamboo tea. So uh, you can get started right away. You get started right away by not consuming aluminum, either through your nose or through your gut. Easy to avoid. I'll see if I can get Mary to come out here in a few minutes and uh, tell you what we do in our home in terms of avoiding aluminum toxicity. So you want to do that. And if you you know have any concern, you know, I've been aware of this for for 40 years. We have not had aluminum in our home for 40 years. Just just add a side note here. I can remember when I was a little boy, I must have been eight years old, a, a, a pots and pan salesman came to our, our door and tried to sell another set of cookware to my parents who were, who were pretty broke at that time in their life. And what he did is he, he put something in, in the aluminum pot and pan and showed that cooking aluminum pots and pans resulted in all these deposits of aluminum. And you know, they asked my parents, do you want you and your children to be eating this? You know, so that was, what, I, that was like 70 years ago, they knew about this. All right. The research is in the bottom left-hand corner or bottom right-hand corner. You can read it. You know, and the nice thing about uh, what I tell you, if for those of you who have any doubts of the sincerity of the, of the amount of information that backs up what I say, is just look up the research. What you'll find quickly is this research is forgotten and buried. Why? Because there's no money. All right, so this is it. This is this is what you're being offered, you and your family. You're being offered these monoclonal antibody drugs. There are new ones coming out all the time, but they all do the same thing. They induce antibodies that attack the garbage left over from the inflammation due to aluminum. So the aluminum is, goes into the body, deposited in the brain tissue. It's not supposed to be there. The body reacts to this aluminum as if it was a invading substance as if it was a foreign body. Okay, so you got, you know, globs of molecules and globs and slivers of aluminum in your brain, and you can actually see these in electron microscopes. If you want to take and pursue the research, you'll see uh, slices of the brain tissue that show aluminum associated with these neurofibril tangles and senile plaques. It's right before your eyes. If you remove the aluminum from the body, then you stopped or slowed the progression of the disease, which is what the research showed in 1980, but it's been totally ignored. And the price paid is the patient. The profits made are the drug companies. Get real. All right, any questions? There's kind of a, a general discussion about how you're getting screwed. Yeah, Dr. McDougall. I shouldn't, I shouldn't have said that, should I? <laughs> That's fine. Dr. <laughs> McDougall, people are asking, is dementia the same as Alzheimer's? Uh, it is a form of, uh, Alzheimer's is a form of dementia. Dementia is just a, a, a early, earlier than expected deterioration of your neurologic functions. So you can be an alcoholic and you become demented. You can have multiple strokes, a big stroke, you know, where it takes a big section of your brain or little tiny strokes that take out uh, 
you know, hundreds or thousands of pieces of brain tissue. So alcoholism, strokes are two of the other common causes, probably represents somewhere between 20 and 40% of the dementias. The uh, other dementias you can pretty much figure are due to Alzheimer's. So that's 60 to 80% of the cases of premature loss of your ability to think, which is dementia, is caused by aluminum poisoning. It's aluminum poisoning. So it's so aluminum poisoning. Get it, get it, look up the research. And besides that, what if what if I'm wrong? What if what if what if it's what if I my recommendations to you are uh, completely 100 percent wrong except for the cost and toxicity? What harm have I done you? Have I uh, caused a 20 to 30 percent chance of you having brain swelling and brain bleeding and a risk of dying? Have I cost you twenty five thousand dollars a year? Have I inconvenienced you? to have you go in for an infusion of drug twice a week or once every four weeks. Well, what have I done to hurt you by recommending that you get, you take in silica water? Or how about if you really have definitive Alzheimer's disease and you find a healthcare provider to, to locate and administer because it's available. You know, this was off Amazon that I showed you these bottles. I put you on a regime of two shots a day in your muscles. This is administered by your spouse or your child or your parent. What harm have I done you? Cost you virtually nothing. Inconvenience? Well, you know, you get used to the shots. It's just, it's just really, it's almost too hard to believe, except it keeps happening over and over again. Same thing. Statin drugs, bypass surgery, cancer chemotherapies, radical surgery for cancer, over and over again. Money wins out. Doing less is more in most cases. Changing somebody's diet is nonprofit, always will be. That's the problem. If these people, the, the doctors, the hospitals, the drug companies, the device companies could figure out a way to make money doing the right thing, they would. They're not bad people. They just don't know how to make money by doing the right thing. So they find something they can justify, like, like you know, Laquimbi and its associated drugs, your monoclonal antibody drugs. They fought. I tell you, if you go back and look at the controversy over the last six or seven years, you can see where a lot of very, very well-known scientists and doctors said, don't do this. Don't do this. The, the, the benefits are so few and the harms are so substantial. Yeah, but, but we make $25,000 a year per patient. Yes, we do. <laughs> All right. Okay, get it. It's kind of up to you. You got to decide. What do you want? Well, there are people out there, and a lot of people. In fact, I have to say, most people, based on my fifty years of experience, that would rather be drugged than change their diet. It's just too hard to change your diet. And besides, they don't believe this is true. Even though you know, I'll present for you the science. You know, I'll talk to you from a point of view of uh, the most sincerity I could possibly muster up. They just don't believe it. it was true. You'd think that somebody would tell you. Well, they have told you. They've written it in the research. The science is there. You're just not reading it. And the people who are interpreting the science for you have a conflict of interest, which is they're making a bucket of money. You have another question? Uh, yes, I do, Dr. McDougall. Uh, first, I just want to Thank you, Nadesh, for her generous super chat donation. You brought me luck, Dr. McDougall. Thank you so much. Uh, somebody wrote in that she heard that taking Benadryl increases the risk for dementia. Is that true? I've never heard that. Okay. I, I've never heard that. So there are lots of things that I've never heard of, but I, I would have to say uh, it's probably a minor issue. A Benadryl will help you sleep. Uh, it may make you think less well because you're a little bit sedated. So in that way, it may make you appear to be a little bit more demented, but I can't see any positive correlation with long-term damage. Thank you. People are asking about what about the aluminum in soda cans or LaCroix waters? Is that something to be worried about? It counts. 
In fact, in, in, there's a paper that, that I'd have to pull up, but you can find it. Just look up soda cans and aluminum content. And you'll find that in various types of, of soda, depending on whether it's a cola or a ginger ale or et cetera, uh, it, it will cause the, the aluminum to accumulate in the liquid you drink. Now, what the can industry has done as a response to this is they put a coat of plastic um, on the aluminum can with the idea that this plastic coat will, will protect you from the aluminum. I'd like to believe that. I, I'd like to believe it. I mean, I, I like, you know, I find it convenient to drink my, my soda water out of uh, aluminum cans. That's all that's available. Well, unless I make my own. <laughs> I have, well, well I some, have some things like some of them come in plastic bottles. Is that any better? Right. Like, or glass bottles? Yeah, like Perrier. Yeah. And, and um, the other one, Pellegrino, comes in both plastic and glass. And some of the people are, or some of the companies are lining their aluminum cans with B, like BPA free, I'm hearing. Is, is yeah. that better? Well, I, I hope it's right. You know, I, I, I haven't really taken the trouble to look up any, any results of this effort. But I'd like to believe it's right. I, I would like to. I would like to know that that uh, the, the things that I do are beneficial and not harmful. I'm like you guys. I like to hear good news about my bad habits, unless unless the consequences are pretty darn serious, which they are. Then I don't want you to lie to me. But I just love hearing that, that uh, non-dairy chocolate ice cream is good for you. Anybody want to give me a study on that? Come on, you guys. <laughs> the, way, the way Mary and I handle is we only let one of those non-dairy slip into our home every few months. Yeah. Otherwise, we're out of control. I got another super chat. Thank you, Mark. You're you're my lucky charm, Dr. McDougal. Dr. McDougal, people uh, have used these cans and pots and pans and maybe deodorants and antiperspirants for years. So if they stop now, is there aluminum already in their body? Is there a way for yep. them to clear it? Loads of aluminum, probably enough to give you Alzheimer's. But you can get rid of it. I just showed you how to get rid of it. You know, I just showed you that you know, a quarter of a bottle of silica water is enough silica to make a difference, a clinical difference in the outcome of Alzheimer's. And I gave you the scientific paper that supports that. Wow. And if you drank, if you drank four bottles of silica water, it would do you no harm. And you could probably afford it. Are you drinking this every day yourself? No, I'm not. But you know, I've known about the aluminum issue for four decades. We've st we've steered clear of aluminum for at least forty years. And uh, you know, I'm seventy six years old so far. Do you think I need it? Maybe, no. maybe that's the audience. Maybe that's what the audience is observing: is that <gasps> I need to be consuming more silica water. No. Yeah. Well, I don't. I, I don't. But did you know something? It's only because of convenience. Uh, it's a still water, the silicas that I put up there. I like sparkling water. It, it's just, it, you know, if if Fiji water turned up on my doorstep, then it was, uh, particularly if it was uh, full of gas bubbles, which I like, I'd switch over to that in a minute. But no, I don't. I don't personally do it. I drink a lot of tea, though. Okay, that, that's one thing that Mary and I do do is we drink a lot of tea, non-caffeinated tea. That's our favorite beverage. If you see us with a with a cup, you know we're drinking during these shows. So it's a non-caffeinated tea. Excuse me, it is caffeinated. It is a no. It's non-caffeinated. It's non. We drink it without caffeine. Non-caffeinated tea because the amount of tea we drink, we'd be high all day long. We'd, we'd be bouncing off the walls. So I, you know, I do take silica-containing teas. Dr. McDougall, we have questions that were submitted, but they're not specifically on Alzheimer's. Right, well, you know, let me see if I can get Mary, if she will come and join us. And yeah, because there's that, actually a question for Mary on Mary's mini. So if she does come, that would be great. We, we can answer just general questions you want for a few minutes. Oh, and, okay, that would be great. Fantastic. Whether she shows up or not, I can't promise she, maybe if you. Maybe if you just gave her a little clap or something, you said, Mary, we want to hear you. Mary, <laughs> Dr. McDougall, you always- right, No, she said, ask my questions first, and then she'll come in just to say hello. 
Thank you. You always say that if people follow the diet that you recommend, they don't need to cover up their body odor with antiperspirants and deodorants. Yeah, yeah, that's for sure. You know, you stink of what you eat. Now, I've, I've read a few a few books uh, about the Inuit Eskimo and uh, white explorers. They will report that the Inuit Eskimo stinks like fish. You know, I back back premarital days, I would date women from other parts of the world, other cultures, uh, and I would smell the spices in their cooking. You, you smell like what you eat. When I was a sugar plantation doctor, still eating meat, you know, still a heavy meat eater back back then, back in 1973. I, I was taking care of a whole bunch of, uh, of hippies. So they call them back then, it was hippies from uh, the Honokai area of the Big Island of Hawaii. And they were my patients. And uh, some of them, you know, many of them didn't wash for weeks. And, and they would come to my office and uh, they would, they would be pretty odiferous, but they didn't smell bad. They just had an odor to them. Odor is extremely important. Uh, how you smell is a real important indicator to your health. If you eat unhealthy foods, you stink in a repulsive manner. If you eat healthy foods, you smell like fruits and vegetables. If you drink, eat the wrong foods, you smell like dead animals, rotting dead animals. Now, the problem is, is when everybody smells the same, you don't notice, okay? We have, we have adaptive mechanisms so that we take common stimulants, common sensory stimulants, and we are able to ignore them. And I'm getting, I'm getting carried away on too many different things here, but uh, if you eat plants, you'll smell like fruits and vegetables. If you eat pigs and cows and chickens, what do you think you're gonna smell like? So, uh, and anyway, odor is extremely important when it comes to your relationships with people. Uh, business relationships. Uh, what we do is we judge people based upon the way they look and the way they smell as to whether they're healthy. And you know what we do, particularly it's been studied in terms of, of visual stimuli, is what we do is we choose people who are healthy to work in our companies. The reason is, is we want productive people who can work all day long, be most efficient. We don't want sick people. So you look at, and you know, I know I'm going to offend some of you, but I, I'll offend some of you if it's okay. And that is that people who are overweight and diabetic have been shown to get have be less likely to get a job, less likely to enter, be able to enter college. They're less likely to get promotions. It's prejudice. Sure it is. It's prejudice. But it's it's based upon the fact that you want healthy people working beside you. Okay, here's 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 the, the real clicker. And and that is that. Whether or not you fall in love or sexually attracted to somebody depends upon how they smell. It's not how they look. I mean, that's important, but it's the odor. Uh, how, why am I so sure of this? Because I, I realize there's a billion dollar perfume industry out there that uh, has realized that the way you smell brings up uh, feelings of love and sexual desire, et cetera. So they're trying to make hormones. Pheromones, pheromones, which are, are they smell like sex, okay? And not been able to get quite there yet. And so what they do is they make scents that cover up the stink you have from eating dairy, and beef, and chicken, and fish, and cows, et cetera. With, with some success, not a lot. Uh, anyway, uh, what uh, Napoleon Bonaparte, told his uh, girlfriend not to wash. He was coming home in four or five days. Oh, I know <laughs> that's too far, that's too far past you guys. Uh, scent is important. It's extremely important when it comes to your communication with other people. Oh, anyway, so I get to the reproductive thing. Uh, love, sexual desire, et cetera, that you experience is determined by smell as well as sight. And the reason is, is because in your pursuit to have a family, to have offspring. You want to mate with the best sperm and the best egg you can find. In other words, the healthiest person you can find, you're gonna mate with to produce the healthiest offspring. This is natural selection, this is survival, you know? And so 
I, I know that doesn't play a big part in your life because what happens, I was going to get into a whole discussion about sensory adaptation. You stop noticing the things that are common because likely things that are common are safe. So your, your body, your mind kind of discounts these things and makes it available for new stimuli for you to register. For example, if you were, say you're sitting in your house right now in front of your computer screen, and there's a, a person out there uh, cutting the lawn with a noisy lawnmower. You notice that when you first walked into the room, maybe, maybe, but now you don't notice it. Why? Because your mind has declared that sound as being safe. And so what you'll notice is uh, other things that happen, like somebody opens a door or takes out a knife or loads a gun or something like that, something that you really want your senses to pay attention to. It's the same thing with odor. Uh, you may have noticed that at Christmas time, you went into somebody's house and you smelled the Christmas tree. Or at Thanksgiving, you went into somebody's house and you smelled the scent of cooking turkey or whatever they're cooking. That was the first time you were exposed to that. You know, after a few minutes, you didn't notice it. And the next time you walked into that person's house, you probably didn't notice it or, or it was a much less time you were aware of it because you adapt to safe things in your environment. So why do you not notice that other people stink like cows and pigs and chickens and fish? And they do. Because you smell the same way. Because it's common and familiar. But if you don't eat that kind of diet, like, for example, I was eating a, a cow and pig and chicken diet back when I was a, beginning as a sugar plantation doctor. My, my vegans, they smelled. Not unpleasantly, but they smelled. I noticed it right away. Whereas... The other, you know, 50 or 100 people I would see that day smell just like me. I didn't notice them. So you do stink. You're just not aware of it. And, and these smells, you may not be aware of it in terms of, oh, I, I smell something ugly or repulsive, et cetera. They still have a tremendous influence on what goes on. You, you just don't, you put them on your awareness, but they're still there. The brain is still looking at these things, smelling these things, noticing these things. Your mind hasn't forgotten that what you want to do is you want to be with the best people possible at work and in the bedroom. Why? Because you want to have the most effective outcomes of your behaviors. And so you want healthy people around you. Okay. That was a long discussion. I'll That's tell you. Okay. Uh, so um, here's a question on a different topic, and it's from um, Evan. And Evan knows that you're hesitant about um, people getting colonoscopies, especially screening ones. But they're asking if they had precancerous polyps removed and were told to come back in another five years to check, then do you recommend they continue getting them if they've actually had something? Okay, first of all, that's not screening. Screening is when you take healthy people and you look for disease. This person has been declared unhealthy. They've been found to have polyps. So they don't fit into the typical picture of screening. You see the difference? They would fit more into what I would call diagnostic colonoscopy. In other words, they found they had a problem and now you're going to go in and, you know, re realize that you are looking for more polyps, but you're, all, you're all already dealing with a sick colon. So that, that's the main distinction there. I think that if you need a diagnostic colonoscopy, you probably should have it. And you'd have that, say, under the circumstance of finding blood in your stool on uh, a stool card or a cologard, the, uh, the genetic material. Once, once you flunk one of these tests, it's no longer screening. The screening test was the blood in the stool. The screening test was the cologard. Now you're on to a diagnostic colonoscopy. Okay, so screening colonoscopy, uh, there was just a 10-year study. I think it was called the Nordic study. It was done in Poland, Norway, just published. It was published October 22nd, 2022. It was a 10-year study on colonoscopy. And what they found is those who got colonoscopies had no better outcomes, no better survival after 10 years than those that didn't. You know, I, I, know, I know this upset the gastroenterology. Gastro, um, intestinal specialist, uh, because that's your bread and butter. I know that was upsetting too, but that's the only 
the only randomized control trial ever done on colonoscopy. And it shows that colonoscopy fails. It doesn't fail to find polyps. Oh, it does that. That's no question about that. But what you're interested in is how long you're going to live. There's no survival advantage to those who have the colonoscopy and don't. None, zero, period, don't do it. The colonoscopies are dangerous. And when they're unleashed on a well public, in other words, you do something called disease mongering, where you turn healthy people into patients, should not be done. So what do I recommend when it comes to colon cancer? Well, I recommend that you check your stool for blood, check your stool for genetic material like Cologuard, and or you have one sigmoid exam around age uh, 60. Yeah. Younger than 60, you're not likely to have colon cancer, certainly younger than 50. After the age of, say, 75, you're not going to live long enough to, if there were any benefits from finding colon cancer or polyps, you're not going to live long enough. Let's face it. So what I recommend is screening for polyps, which are precancerous lesions, not cancer, by using stool blood tests or stool immunologic tests and or, depends on how aggressive you want to be, and or a two-foot tube costs you $200 for the exam, is virtually without any side effects and painless and does not require an anesthesia. That's a sigmoid exam. Can you get a sigmoid exam done? No. Why not? Why not when the research says that a sigmoid examination will actually reduce your risk of dying? Why does it do that? Because it's taking out precancerous lesions. Not cancer, but precancerous. So you take out, you, you reduce the burden of precancerous lesions. Plus, you don't end up killing people. The problem with colonoscopy is you take out the same lesions, but you end up killing people through anesthesia, perforations, bleeding. You know, the risk of severe complications in people who have colonoscopies where they remove a polyp is about seven tenths of a percent. In other words, you know, one out of a hundred people really suffers terribly. You know, about one out of a thousand has a perforation, one out of 2000 dies. These are perfectly healthy people enjoying their children and enjoying playing pick a, pick a ball you know, having a great old time and you say, hey, you need to get your colon examined, lady. What you're doing by accepting colonoscopy is you're risking your life today with the theoretical possibility that in 10, 20, 30 years, you'll have a reduced risk of dying of colon cancer. However, when you measure that based on the Nordic study published October 22nd, 2022, I believe it was the Journal of the American Medical Association, there is no survival advantage after 10 years of extensive research involving tens of thousands of people. Doesn't work. You won't live any longer. Why would you do it? And I didn't even talk to you about diet, which is the cause of colon polyps and colon cancer. And if you change your diet, there's good evidence that colon polyps will go away. And if there's good evidence, if you change your diet, you'll live longer even if you have colon cancer. So why isn't that being promoted? Come on, come on, figure it out. Come on, give me an answer. Why isn't it being told? Why aren't you told? Why isn't the emphasis on good diet? Why isn't the emphasis on inexpensive early detection tests? Why not? A colonoscopy costs $3,000. A sigmoid exam is 200. Stool for blood costs you somewhere between four and $40. Answer the question, please. Why are these, why are the monoclonal antibodies so popular and silica water is not? Or deferoxamine, why? Come on now, you, you were gonna tell me at the end of this lecture, why? And show me that I'm missing something. It's the money. Now, the nice thing is, is the liars, the cheaters, and the polluters are getting caught. Just like with these uh, MABs, they're getting caught. 
Now, they still have more money than we have, but the public at least is being made aware of their criminality. Okay, thank you, Dr. McDougall. Here is a question from Susie about fibromyalgia. Uh, her and her husband are 100% vegan, 90% whole foods with an occasional fast food burger slipping in. And her husband, who's 73, was diagnosed two years ago with fibromyalgia and has almost daily chronic pain, takes Savella and Lyrica, and they sort of work. And some varieties of cannabis offer the best relief, but he doesn't like feeling stoned all the time. And she's wondering, in regards to food choices, are there certain ones to avoid or certain ones to embrace? Absolutely. Uh, the Lyrica and similar drugs are at best symptom relief, at best. And most of them are gray label. In other words, they're not really indicated to treat fibromyalgia. They're, they're drugs that were invented for some purpose, but didn't seem to work out as far as the profitability is concerned. So they're, they're prescribed under a gray label. In other words, once you're a doctor and you have a prescription pad, you can prescribe a drug for almost anything you want and get away with it. Uh, so, you know, you ought to give up on malaria and similar drugs. This is an autoimmune problem. It's the body attacking the muscles and the skin and the tendons. So you're chronically inflamed. And you call it fibromyalgia. You could call it, uh, uh, anyway, you could, you could give it a, a lot of names. You could call it rheumatoid arthritis and ankylosing spondylitis, and you know if it gets bad enough, you'll call it lupus. But your body is attacking your muscles and your tendons and your skin, et cetera. Now, why is it doing that? Well, it's doing it because it, it, it is attacking you. Well, why is it doing that? Why is my body attacking me? Well, it's attacking you because it's confused. The reason your body is confused is because you are eating foreign muscles and tendons and skin, et cetera. So what happens is you eat these foreign body parts. You know, foreign body parts, they come from cows and pigs and chickens and things like that. These are called foreign, foreign, they're not you. They're foreign body parts. And how do they get into your food? Well, pretty much a lot of products, but if you wanna really get a high concentration of foreign body parts, you eat hot dogs or sausages, they don't waste anything on slaughterhouse. So anyways, what happens is um, tissues that your husband are complaining are being inflamed, they're being attacked because your body sees these pig and cow muscle parts, proteins, pig and cow tendon proteins, pig and cow skin proteins. It sees them and it makes antibodies against them, but it gets confused and it sees similar ant antigens uh, that belong to you. And so while looking for the cow and the pig foreign body parts, it ends up attacking your body parts. So what do you do about it? Well, the basic McDougall diet takes care of most people who have these kinds of symptoms. Our results with real serious autoimmune diseases like rheumatoid arthritis and lupus and nonspecific arthritis and ankylosing spondylitis are, are nothing short of a cure for many people. Ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease, et cetera. We do that with uh, the basic McDougall diet and that's usually enough. But if somebody came to me that was really serious about their autoimmunity, I'd say you gotta do one other thing. And I think all of you should start with this one other thing. You follow the basic diet, plus you make it gluten-free. Why? Because probably everybody, but certainly some people, have a very serious problem handling a protein, uh, a glycoprotein, in other words, a sugar protein molecule that's in large concentrations in wheat, barley, and rye. And this protein in sensitive people, we call these people celiac patients for patients with... Uh, Anyway, it doesn't matter. I'll think about it in a skin condition. Uh, we, we, uh, we put them on gluten-free diets, but I think there's a, a, a spectrum here, a, a subclinical issue that goes on where anybody who eats enough gluten 
and that would be like two pounds of bread a day, is going to have some damage to their intestinal mucosa. And that when you're damaging intestinal mucosa, you open up the barrier, you, you cause a leaky gut. And so you're more likely to get the cow and the pig muscle and uh, antigens and the cow and the pig skin and tendon antigens, and those proteins, antigens of proteins, to get through the gut into the bloodstream where the body's immune system, it's, it's lymphocytes will make antibodies against these foreign proteins. So the next step, in addition, it should be the first step. It's part of the first step. If you have serious concern about autoimmune disease, you go gluten-free along with a diet of starches, vegetables, and fruits. You say, well, how do I eat the McDougal diet if I'm going to be gluten-free? That's full of gluten. It's wheat, barley, and rye. That's all you have to give up. You can eat rice and corn and potatoes and sweet potatoes. And there are a whole bunch of grains out there that are not high gluten. My September 2009 newsletter has a whole discussion about celiac disease and what foods on a starch-based diet you can consume. I think it's September 2009, if you want to look up the newsletter. Anyway, that's what you got to do to see if your husband can get well. How long will it take him to get well? Eh, usually about four to seven days. When should he give up following your silly advice that you didn't want to do anyways, which is the McDougal diet, a diet that's based on starches, fruits and vegetables, no animals, no added oils with the addition of getting rid of uh, wheat, barley, and rye? How long should you do that before you give up on McDougal? How long? I told you the benefits start in four to seven days. Why do you have to wait four to seven days? You've got to get the gut cleared of the old food. It takes four to seven days to poop all that stuff out. But find somebody else after four months if, if you haven't found the answer with me. And anyway, the last step you go on to, and I've had people had to do this. Got to reason, realize I, I've had contact with hundreds of thousands of people. And 12,000 have been what I call my patients. I've touched them. I've talked to them personally. You know, anyway, it's uh, the treatments are very effective. It fits into the criteria, just like the MABs, the monoclonal antibodies. I'm not going to let you forget about that. Is uh, the treatment I offer is no profit for anybody. And you have to do it. But you have to do it anyway. So you, you got to remember to take the pills, go for your IV infusions, uh, get your, your MRIs done, see if your brain is swollen and bleeding. Yeah, that's a lot of work to be on these drugs, too. You just didn't think about it. And all you had to do was make a bowl of oatmeal. That's all I had to do. You asked me to take all these tests and get brain bleeding and spay $25,000 a year. And you just, you didn't tell me all I had to do was eat a bowl of oatmeal. Well, I'm telling you. And for lunch, you must have, you know, like bean soup. And for dinner, you have, uh, I don't know, a minestrone soup without the wheat. Well, they made it sound like they're already 90% uh, whole food no, plant-based. That's, no, that's not what I heard, Mary. Or, <laughs> Mary <laughs> that's not what I heard. What I heard is they have been pretty close. You know, they still have some improvement in their diet to, to meet. Uh, we didn't talk about the celiac part. We didn't talk about them really being strict, not eating out, et cetera. So what I heard is that they're doing better than most people. And they expect the results because they've suffered so much and made so many changes, but they don't have them yet. I understand. But you haven't done what I asked you to do. So until you do, you can't say it doesn't work. But you can't say it doesn't work after four months of doing what I suggested. And if you're having trouble doing it, then let us help you. We run a 12-day telemedicine program every month or two where our whole team will take you through it. We'll make sure you do it. We'll make sure you got it right. So that will help you. I also want to mention that every Sunday night, I have a chance to advertise the Chef, Chef AJ show. And I do that on our free live YouTube channel every Sunday evening at five o'clock Pacific time. And there's a time for you to ask questions too. Just just tune in. Heather will take your questions and uh, I'll, I'll or Mary and I'll try and answer them for you. Every Sunday night, five o'clock Pacific time, the McDougal channel live for an hour. And of course I'm here every every first Monday of the month too. 
right? And we put it's that not, in. The it's, it's, I'm kind of running out of things to talk to people about. Do I no, start you repeating? Could, Dr. McDougal, you could just answer questions for hours. So many come in and we're, we just have no, so many. But, but that, that's not as challenging for me. Uh, and, and I'm afraid I'll lose people if I don't make it, continue to make it interesting and challenging. So I, I need some topics, guys. Why don't you write me a note and tell me you'd like me to discuss such and such. And I'll probably write you back and say, I've already talked about that. You'll find it on YouTube if you put in McDougal and autoimmune diseases, just like we just talked about fibromyalgia. Look up on YouTube, McDougal and autoimmune disease if you want to have the whole story. An hour and 10 minutes of a discussion on how you get autoimmune diseases, where the science is, et cetera. Well, here's something I don't know if you've talked about. It's a question from Mary, and she contracted Lyme's disease this summer. Mm -hmm. She's been whole food plant-based for two years. Is there anything she can do to help her body recover? She took doxycycline for 21 days, and she's suffering right. from extreme fatigue still. Yeah. Okay, this is a parasitic infection. This is a, a spirochete. Syphilis, you know, the venereal disease, syphilis is due to a similar spirochete. It's transmitted by the bite from certain ticks. And they're present, mm, well, they're mostly on the East Coast, Northeast, but now they're every place. Why are they every place? Well, because of climate change. You know, the bugs are being able to occupy new territories, uh, new infectious agents or previous infectious agents are becoming more widespread. So uh, all of these diseases, everything, COVID-19 to, you know, to spirochete infections, to Ebola, everything's going to become more common. Plan on it. Uh, well, I think changing your diet and being really strict on your diet is a good step, but this is an infection. The initial step, and again, based on money, that's where the money is, hospitalizations, drugs, et cetera. And the, the success rate is not that high, but that's standard therapy is we give uh, large doses of antibiotics intravenously sometimes for a long time. But there's another area of research that has never been explored, which I hope someday somebody does. I won't. It was uh, invented or at least popularized to some extent by Henry Heimlich. Henry Heimlich was my friend. Henry Heimlich has saved more people's lives than any person who's walked this earth through the Heimlich maneuver in the Heimlich chest tube. I did a whole, uh, a whole uh, newsletter on Henry and talked about our relationship, et cetera. When Henry Heimlich got sick, the greatest honor that I've gotten as a doctor, when he got ill back when he was about 70 years old, he lived in his 90s, but he went to my program at St. Lena Hospital when he got sick. And he got well. I'm not going to discuss his diseases any further, except that he lived... You know, another 25 years based on the McDougal diet. Anyway, Henry Heimlich, uh, he, of course, invented the Heimlich maneuver, which all of you should know. In particular, in summer times when people drowned, you must do the Heimlich maneuver before you do anything else. Uh, let me spend just a minute on this because it's important because it's going to happen in your neighborhood. You're going to have a drowning victim, particularly a child. And you're going to try and administer CPR. You blow air into their lungs and push on their heart. And the person's going to die. Plan on it. They're going to die. Unless you get the water out of their lungs first. Because you can't breathe any air into the lungs that are filled with water. So the way Henry Heimlich talks about this is uh, he talked about how the traditional lifeguard would take somebody, they'd go out in the water, they'd grab a hold of a drowning person, half drowned, full water, and they'd throw them over their shoulder and they'd run them up to the beach. And by the time they got to the beach and threw them on the ground, they'd already coughed up all the water. They're fine. So you have to do the Heimlich maneuver first to get the water out of the lungs or you're not going to save your child. Think about it. Tell your friends. We're back to getting to Henry Heimlich. Uh, Henry Heimlich, uh, got interested in Lyme disease because he had the same attitude I have. He liked, he loved patients. He thought that, that people deserve to have the honest truth. And so what he did is he looked at some work done back in the 1930s, work for which the scientists received the Nobel Prize. It was 1937. 
there was a condition that was widespread then called tertiary syphilis. Remember, it's a spirochete, just like the spirochete in line. Tertiary syphilis, uh, you could treat it with penicillin if it wasn't deep in the bones and the brain, et cetera. And then we call it tertiary. And then you're dead. It wouldn't touch, the antibiotics wouldn't touch it. Kind of like with Lyme disease. You know, it's gotten deep in the system and typical antibiotics won't touch it. And so what Henry Heimlich did is he, he um, looked back at the work of this Nobel Prize winner and found that what he did is he infected his patients, won the Nobel Prize for it, with malaria, the parasite malaria, a curable form of malaria. And the cure rate was 100%. And the toxicity was virtually none. And the cost, of course, was nothing. I mean, how, how are you going to charge somebody for giving them a, a syringe full of malaria parasites? Huh? 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 People would be growing their own malaria parasites in their basement. They'd be out of business pretty quick, wouldn't they? Anyway, through the, the inflammatory response, not just the fever, but the other thing that's taking place with the immune system, uh, the body was able to rid itself of the syphilis spirochete. So anyways, Henry Heimlich, he started, he published uh, in some of the journals. You can read it. Just look up Henry Heimlich and Lyme disease. You'll find it without any trouble. Anyway, he started treating patients who had tertiary syphilis, just like this lady did, with a malaria infection. Now, where are you going to find somebody to infect you with malaria? Not in the big Google program. No, I'm not going to take on that particular problem. I'll let somebody else do that. I don't know. What would I, what would I do? If I had tertiary syphilis like, or tertiary Lyme disease, like this person says, I'd probably go to someplace where I could get a treatable form of malaria. There, there are several forms. So, well, you know, some of them are, very, they respond to chloroquine. You're cured like easily. And so in the meantime, before you're cured, you run these spiking fevers and immune responses as the, as the parasite grows in the system and the antibodies that attack the Malaria end up attacking and killing the spirochete. So what would I do? Well, I'd probably go to, you know, some places in the world I've been to many times. Many of you have been with me to trips through the, uh, through the very Central American countries, Panama, Colombia, and maybe even Costa Rica. They might even have some good malaria parasites down there, and I'd make myself at home and I'd get infected with the right kind of with the right kind of uh, malaria organism. And I get the chloroquine by my side so that after a couple of weeks of being sick, and I'd be sick for a couple of weeks with intermittent fevers, I'd treat myself with chloroquine and go home. I bet I'd be fine. But you'll never know. You'll never know because nobody's going to do the science on it. Why is nobody going to do the science on it? Remember, this man, this scientist won the Nobel Prize for treating tertiary syphilis, a spirochete disease, with infection of a malaria parasite. He won the Nobel Prize. And yet, in this country, the interest isn't in the patient. The interest is in selling drugs. I'll bet you never heard of that one before. Tune in to Chef AJ show, and you'll be brought a whole bunch of new interesting topics. Like infect yourself with the malaria. Well, you tell your friends and relatives that that was what our Dr. McDougall said. Then you tell them if you look up the science, you'll see he's right. Thanks, Dr. McDougall. Here is a question with some diseases I don't know about, but maybe you do. And this is from Holly. And she says she's followed you for years and ate a plant-based diet. But two years ago, she was diagnosed with MCAS an LPP and directed to a low histamine diet, which meant giving up almost everything on the plant-based diet, legume, soy, tofu, fermented foods, tomato, eggplant, et cetera, and switch to chicken, milk, and a few veggies and wheat and corn. Uh, so, <laughs> um, she obviously didn't get better. what? She obviously didn't get better. Why would she be calling you if she did? Yeah. Um, so, she wants to know how you, how you work with this diet and, uh, she's lost so much weight and has to add nutritional drinks. Do you ever have people in your program with these conditions? Well, probably, but I'd have to think back and try and remember and familiarize myself a little bit with her actual condition. But I've heard of people being on low histamine diets before. I've never imagined there'd be any value to it. But obviously there wasn't in this situation because she's still sick. So stop doing things that don't work. 
I told you, if it's going to work, you're going to see the benefits without a question in four months. So stop doing what doesn't work. So follow some other recommendations. And what I would suggest to you is you should be looking at the elimination diet. I mean, good grief, you're, you are obviously a person who has suffered greatly when it comes to the dinner table. Look what you've done so far, living on chicken. A bunch of other stuff that most of us listening to the show would eat. So you, you have the, the strength, the desire to do it. My goodness, the elimination diet should be a, a breath of fresh air for you. The elimination diet is described in my May 2014 newsletter. And it's based on the foods that are least likely to give you trouble. Okay, they're brown rice, sweet potatoes, taro, green and yellow vegetables, and non-citrus fruits, all thoroughly cooked. These are the foods that you're least likely to have a problem with. But let me even go simpler for this person, and those of you who think this is just too overwhelming to eat something that would likely get you better in four to seven days. But it may take four months. You can live on sweet potatoes and water. I'll talk to you in four months. Sweet potatoes will give you everything you need, except for B12, which we're not gonna talk about. It takes you 20 or 30 years to run out of your B12. So we've got a long time to talk about it. You just live on sweet potatoes and water. Until you live on sweet potatoes and water for four months, I'm not gonna listen to you. I'm not going to hear from you. I, I know you're going to be thin. Yes, you are. You may be hungry enough, so you have to eat 14 sweet potatoes a day. That's okay. But you can't prove me wrong until you've done sweet potatoes and water for the next four months. It's nutritionally excellent to do that. You've got, you're eating a low-protein diet, which is least stress on your system. You're eating a whole bunch of beta carotene. After all, they're orange. You got loads of protein, loads of fats, loads of everything that you need. All your vitamins, except for B12 and vitamin sunshine. You don't get enough of that from sweet potatoes. You know vitamin sunshine, don't you? Anyway, you're not incurably ill until you've done that. And, and I'm serious. You know, I have people who come to my... 12 day or 10 day program or whichever program we're running. And they'll have overwhelming problems. They'll be dying of heart failure or cancer. And that's all they can think about. I understand, you know, it's been tough for you to go through the program and pay attention to our education. And I know you didn't figure out how to cook from our various cooking instructors. And, you know, just, it, you just didn't quite understand. So when we sat, sat down at the end of the, the time together, you know, from our 10 to 12 day program. Well, we sit down, I, I'll tell you, I understand you didn't really learn how to do the diet. So until you learn, I want you to go home and eat sweet potatoes and water. That's it. Nothing else. Cooked. And then we'll talk. You'll be fine. I'm not worried about your health at all. I'm not worried about any dietitian telling me there's any deficiency in a diet of sweet potatoes and water. They're not going to do it. I'm not going to worry about any, any doctor to tell me that this is inadequate nutrition because they don't know what they're talking about. I mean, after all, the Papua New Guinea Highlanders, you know, Papua New Guinea, you know that place? Yeah. Well, the, the, the Highlanders, the people who lived up in the mountains who didn't have access to fish, 92% of their diet, traditional diet, this is a population that's been around for 40,000 years. 92% of their diet came from sweet potatoes and leaves and roots. They were warriors. They had babies. They participated in athletic events. They never had heart disease or cancer of the breast or colon or prostate. Never. On sweet potatoes. But after all, you knew this. I mean, you knew this. That diets could and should be simple because you've seen other animals. What do other animals eat? You know, how about uh, koala bears? You know the koala bear, the ones that used to live in Australia before they got burned out? What do they live on? They live on uh, eucalyptus leaves. 
I don't even drink water except on rare occasions, and they just eat eucalyptus leaves. How about panda bears? What do they live on? Bamboo shoots. How about uh, your cat in a native environment? How about your cat live off? You think the cat would eat sweet potatoes? Don't think so. How about eating mice and snakes and birds and other the other uh, animals that a carnivorous animal would eat, like your cat? A simple diet. You know they don't end up having having to eat six thousand different things that are sold in the supermarket. In fact, you know one way to make your animals sick is to feed them that kind of variety of food or try to. And that variety of food, what I'm talking about, are probably table scraps from your table. They get fat. They get sick. The way you make them well is you put them back on their native diet. So simple diets are what animals, all animals, do best on. Think about the Asian. Uh, two billion Asians before 1980 lived on a diet. Two billion Asians before 1980 lived on a diet that was 90% white rice. Had no breast cancer, no colon cancer, no prostate cancer, no heart disease. Now they have a well-balanced diet. Now you take a look at Asians, people from China, Vietnam, Thailand, Japan. Right, look at the ones that have become wealthy. Look at look at the uh, the, the business people. You know, look look at. Uh, Look at the rich Asian these days who switched to the American diet. They can barely fit in a first class seat on an airplane, just like their fellow Americans. They're too fat to even fit in first class. How do I know that? Well, I want some peek up there and see how they're doing. I'm just kidding. All right. Next question. Okay. Thank you, Dr. McDougall. This one is from uh, Deborah, and she says, uh, can you comment or explain lipid levels, both cholesterol and triglycerides? Mine are going up one year after whole food plant-based. I do a 50-50 plate and have maintained a 30-pound weight loss. Should I cut back on healthy whole food carbs? No. No, because on a healthy, high-carb diet, your cholesterol will drop. How much will it drop? Well, our research on nearly 2,000 people shows it'll drop uh, 22 points in seven days. And our research on, you know, significant large groups of people is shows that at the end of a year, they still have dropped 20 points. So, uh, no, you know, you shouldn't follow a diet. The research consistently shows low carb diets based on bacon, butter and brie raised cholesterol. So, first of all, you have to realize that cholesterol is not a disease. No one dies of high cholesterol. And that's why treating cholesterol alone, say with statins, doesn't result in much improvement. Hardly any, maybe a few hours, maybe a few days improvement. It's because cholesterol does not cause illness. It's the food that causes you to be sick, which is also loaded with cholesterol, which also raises your blood cholesterol. What do people die of that high, have high blood cholesterols? They have rotten, rotten arteries. Rotten arteries in the brain, rotten arteries in the heart, these arteries burst. Why? Because they didn't have enough plant food components in the diet. That's why. All right. So since cholesterol is just a marker, a sign of disease, it's not a disease. The correlations are just uh, secondary. They're, they're the fact that the foods that you eat to raise your cholesterol are also the ones that make you sick. But lowering cholesterol with drugs is not going to solve the problem. In fact, the, the newest drugs, the, I forget all the time, the acronym SK something, nine drugs, cost like $10,000 a year. Monoclonal, they're monoclonal antibody drugs. That's what they are. But these new drugs have not been shown to improve survival, yet they are very powerfully lower cholesterol. I just looked up the research on these drugs. You should look it up. They'll drop your cholesterol, but you don't live any longer, period. And the same thing with statins, uh, with, with a lot, little less conviction. I mean, some of the research seems to indicate a few hours of longer life. Not much. Berberine, B-E-R-B-E-R-I-N-E, -E, which is an herb. You buy inexpensively on the internet. Amazon has it. 
Drop your cholesterol 30%. Reduces your risk of dying of heart disease? Probably not. Probably not. Less toxic, less expensive than statins or this other drug I just told you about? Definitely. So if what your goal is to make your numbers look better, then maybe you should take one of these drugs. If your goal is to live longer, then maybe you should fix the problem, which is the food. Now, I realize this. I only say this half-heartedly that you shouldn't lower your cholesterol because I know how a number affects your life. You know, I realize that when you look at your cholesterol and it's like 280 instead of 80, which you'd hoped it would be, you get depressed for the whole day. So if your happiness depends upon looking at numbers, and I, I'm not being un, unrealistic or unreasonable or critical in any way, then lower your numbers, but as safely and as expensively as possible. Don't spend the $10,000 a year to use one of these new monoclonal antibody drugs that have just come out. You know, go to Amazon, get berberine, and get the same number drop in cholesterol that you get in this powerful drug with the same benefits. None. So in answer to your question, uh, I wouldn't pay a lot of attention to the cholesterol number. In Dean Arnish's work, what he showed was whether or not somebody showed healing of the arteries dependent upon not their cholesterol drops, but their adherence to the program. So if you want to die with good looking numbers, take drugs. You want to delay death and have a good time in life? Don't take drugs. Fix the problem. Thank you. You know, when you talked about living on sweet potatoes for four months, one of the viewers said it's too high in potassium and they have high potassium. Well, then they have problems with their kidneys. What can I say? You know, your, your body's very capable of taking care of potassium until you've lost 90% of your kidney function. So I think you better go see a doctor and find out whether you've lost any of your kidney function. Certainly, if you have 20% of your kidney functioning, it can handle all the potassium you'd ever throw at it. 20%, you've lost 80% of your kidneys, it's gone. So if you have a problem with high potassium for any reason, you better find out what's causing it because it can be deadly. Normal potassium is around four to five milliequivalents per liter. You know, you start thinking about it. I do, because I take care of a lot of kidney patients. Not my choice, but they seem to come to see me a lot. And when I start getting in potassium levels over six, I get a little concerned. But it takes a potassium level over seven milliequivalents per liter that you'll develop heart arrhythmias and die. So you better find out what's going on. It's not sweet potatoes, ma'am. It's not sweet potatoes. You got a problem and you need to figure out what it is. Otherwise, I wouldn't worry about your high potassium if you have normal kidney function, unless there's some other reason for it that I just can't think of right now. Thank you. This question um, is from Kathy, and she says, if someone's diagnosed with diabetes and is now on a starch-based, whole food, plant-based diet and losing weight, what would indicate to you that it's time to add a long-term insulin like Lantus? If, okay, this would be type one and a half diabetes that we're talking about. Type one and a half, there's type two, which is where the body makes loads of insulin. It just doesn't work because of insulin resistance, which develops as a normal adaptation. It's not a disease. So you have type two, and then you have type one, which is where the pancreas has been destroyed, where you don't make insulin or not enough. And in between, you have a spectrum. Okay, between no insulin and loads of insulin. And that's called, I call it one type one and a half diabetes or partial pancreatic insufficiency. So uh, the way I deal with this, and, and often patients will come to, to us uh, thinking they have type two diabetes and somehow it just doesn't correct even though they've lost the weight, they eat the diet, they still have elevated blood sugar. Well, you don't have type two, you, you know, you have type one and a half. Because once you've lost all the weight, your insulin resistance has gone away. You're now dealing with insufficient insulin production. All right, so you got somebody trimmed, following the diet, they still have an elevated blood sugar, say it's 200. And it bothers them psychologically. Well, you might wanna treat it that way. It wouldn't bother me psychologically. I 
thinks the patient was doing pretty darn well. But the patient came back and said, you know, doc, I don't like running blood sugars at 200, 180, 220. Okay, well, I'm a doctor. I can make it whatever you want. I'm a doctor. I can make your blood sugar 10. So, you know, you might want to treat psychological problems or concerns like what the numbers are like. And the goal should be no lower than a blood sugar of 150. Because if your goal is lower than 150, then you're likely running blood sugars of 70 or 60 or 50. In other words, you risk hypoglycemia, which can be deadly. Uh, low blood sugars to the brain and eyes cause damage. But more likely, you're going to get confused and you're going to get in an auto accident or get picked up for a DUI or in some other way hurt yourself or people around you. So you do want to avoid hypoglycemia. All right, let's get back to what, what does she do? Okay. So let's assume her blood sugar is too high or the consequences of type one and a half diabetes is you end up um, losing weight. Why? Because insulin pushes fat into fat cells. So if you have inadequate insulin, the fat's not going into your body fat cells. So you lose tremendous amounts of weight. So say you lost too much weight. No, maybe I wouldn't think so, but maybe your friends and relatives do. And you wanna stop the weight loss. Well, you need to have a little insulin. Say you are developed a, a lot of urination, uh, which is followed by a lot of thirst. You don't like that. You know, that's not a good way to spend the day urinating all the time and drinking glasses of water. You don't want to do that. But you're not dead or you're not in the hospital. You don't have ketoacidosis. You're making some insulin. Well, then I give you a little insulin and you stop those symptoms. In other words, the way I would treat you is because you probably need it. So make sure you listen to me carefully is I give you a little bit of long-acting insulin in the evening. If you were worried about the numbers, you lost too much weight, or you had excessive thirst and urination, I give you a little bit of long-acting insulin called Lantus or Livomir is another product. You do one shot at night, you know, maybe five units, maybe 10 units, probably not as much as 20, but maybe five or 10. That should take care of it. And that's all you need. But you know, there's a new insulin that's just been reported on, which I'm excited about. It lasts for a week. And you end up, if you compare it with, say, Lantus, you compare the blood sugar levels and other, you know, hemoglobin A1C, et cetera. What you find is it results in comparable outcomes once a week. That's all you have to think about your diabetes is once a week, not every night not five times a day, not, not every five minutes like you would on an insulin pump. Once a week, you have to consider yourself a sick person. Give yourself a little shot. Go on and have fun. Wouldn't that be nice? You know, have fun with your kids and your job and start thinking about your diabetes all the time. Anyway, that just came out a couple of weeks ago, this new ultra long acting insulin. And you know, it's going to be profitable, so you'll hear about it. It, it fits the criteria of letting the customers know. You've got to let the customers know. You've got to build the base. And the way you do that is you educate them about things. You tell them about GERD, or you teach them about diabetes or obesity or uh, uh, microbiome problems of your bowel bacteria. You know, if you've got a product to sell, you can afford to advertise and to educate the population that they are customers. We had to teach you about cholesterol when statins came out. We had to teach you about the importance of blood pressure when blood pressure pills were popular. We are good business people, really good. We look, we got a drug that'll make a difference that you can appreciate. Now we got to go find you. And so we do that. We do that with uh, education and screening, early detection programs. Yeah. Great. Anyways, Thank you. Okay. You, you, turn, you turn healthy people into patients. That's what you do. You, you don't you need to stop that. Life is more than going to the doctor and going to the hospital. Yeah, that's why I didn't like living in the desert because that's all people did <laughs> was go to the hospital. Well, I, I, I bet that was the case. That I heard last night that the average person, 65 years old, is on five to six medications. I had heard state studies that said that people of that age group were on 12 medications. But regardless, you shouldn't be on any medication. You're just getting older. 
you know, yeah, you're going to die sometime, but in the meantime, between birth and death, you shouldn't need any drugs. They didn't for the last million years. Well, I suppose they had their shamans and took their potions and pills and so on, but they resulted in pretty much the same thing our potions and pills result in. A lot of belief, a lot of placebo effects, but not much, much real outcome. It's just that their drugs, they're all drugs, they're all plant-based drugs, they're all herbs. You know, they, they gave them to you pretty cheap. No insurance companies there involved. Thank you. I got another thanks to you, Dr. McDougall, super chat donation from Linda. Thank you. And we now have a question from Janet. And she says, whole food plant-based for nine years, but before she changed to this diet, she had lung cancer and had surgery to remove the tumor, but no other treatments after the surgery, but slowly developed neuropathy in both feet and part of legs. And it's getting worse with the numbness and is uncomfortable, especially in bed when trying to sleep. Can this be reversed? And what is your advice for reversing this, if it can? So they have a peripheral neuropathy. I don't see how it'd be tied to the lung cancer. And in fact, I would have to say that you're an awful lucky person because the survival rate at five years of lung cancer is like around 5%, pretty, pretty bad. So, um, you know, rejoice in that fact, uh, at least that you didn't uh, get hurt during your initial therapies and you've survived and hopefully the surgery helped you survive. Let's let, I will assume that the doctors believe so regardless of the evidence, but we're not gonna go there today. So now you have peripheral neuropathy. I don't see any association between having part of the lung removed and getting peripheral neuropathy. But again, you know, I'm, maybe I just don't know about it. Uh, how do you take care of usual peripheral neuropathy? You eat a good diet. You know, there's uh, work for, out of Weimar. You know where Weimar is. Uh, That's where I go to the doctor. Yeah, Dr. Neil Medley is my doctor. Yeah. Well, there's research out of Weimar that shows that they had uh, 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 22 patients, I believe, that had per peripheral neuropathy. They put them on the diet. 17 of them got rid of their peripheral neuropathy between uh, four and 20 days. It went away. And it stayed away in these 17 people for four years. That's a guy named Crane published that. You ever meet Crane? Nope. All right. Well, he came before Natalie did. But Milton Crane, he was the head of... Uh, of Weimar for decades. I knew him quite well. He published that paper, Milton Crane. Uh, yeah, you can help peripheral neuropathy, but how often? Uh, maybe, maybe half the time. I, I would say, you know, maybe half the time. And, uh, but, but, you know, it doesn't cost anything. And if you're in the lucky half, that'd be great. You have to realize peripheral neuropathies, eye disease, kidney disease, uh, these are end stage problems. These only happen after decades of diabetes. Or I know in your case, you had the lung cancer. I don't know the implication there. They, they happen. I mean, you've been at this for 40, 30, you know, 20 years, you've been sick. And you finally have what we have and call end organ disease. In other words, the blood vessels in the back of the eye are now so diseased that you have, uh, you, you have obvious damage when you look in the eyes. And the same thing with the kidneys and so on. So if you can get any benefit at all from a good diet, I'd go for it. How about other treatments? Well, I think somebody mentioned Lyrica. Now that's commonly prescribed for peripheral neuropathy. It's just, you know, it's, it's a highly questionable whether it benefits you or not. And uh, B6, B6 has been prescribed for diabetic neuropathy. So I've never found it works. I think of anything else that would help. I, I really, I really can't. All I can say is you got to put your faith in the food, because there are always there's always drug therapies out there for you. you go see a half a dozen doctors; you'll have a half dozen different drugs they'll prescribe. So drug pushers are easy to find. Fix the food. Yep, it's the food. That's what your shirt says. Okay, this is from. Who is it from? Well. This is kind of a weird question, actually. But uh, 
well, I'll, I'll go to this one. This is less weird, not weird at all, actually, from Marianne. She said she listened to a recent PCRM podcast called Obesity is a Disease and learned that Weight Watchers International is now getting into the weight loss drug business. How do you feel about it? Are they selling out, just trying to stay in business? And there is a link to the article if you want me to put it in the chat. Well, I, I, I think they're trying to get in, in business, just like the bariatric surgeons are now using the GLP-1 agonists, you know, the semi-glutides, the Ozempic and the Way Goldie. You know, the stuff that your friends are wishing they could take if they had $1,000 a month to spend on these shots, which are derived from Gila monster reptile poison. Yeah. That's right. They found this little reptile, the only reptile in the North American continent. It's called a Gila monster. And it lives in the Southwest and it produces a, a poison as serious as the poison you get from a diamondback rattlesnake. And it only comes from their lower jaw. And the Gila monster will bite and hold on and inject this GLP-1 agonist into you, which will make you throw up nausea, pain, stomach problems, and you know, intestinal trouble. You know, and this lasts until the Gila monster stops biting. And you still have a sore for a while. Doesn't kill you. I mean, as far as I know, nobody's ever died from a Gila monster bite. But what the drug companies did is they found out about this poison. And they figured if they could make the poison last longer, they could turn it into a shot or pills. That's what they've done. That's why you have Ozempic. That's why you have a class called liraglutides and another class called semaglutides. They just took this basic Gila monster poison and they uh, they made it more commercial. So uh, it works. And it's an easy way to make everybody sick because everybody gets sick. That's how it works. That's the desired side effect. It's nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, stomach pains, gastric retention. Oh, that's a, that's a good new side effect. That I, you see, the, the, the drug companies, they don't want to tell you that the reason that these drugs work is they make you throw up and um, have nausea all day long. They don't want to tell you that, but that's what they do, and that's why why they work. Instead, they talk about things like they delay gastric emptying. Ooh, that sounds really scientific. Or it changes a couple of hormones, ghrelin and insulin, and a few other hormones. Ooh, that sounds sexy, too. Well, you know what? When you delay, delay gastric emptying, you delay gastric emptying. And so the food stays in your stomach. It doesn't go into your small intestine where it should after a few minutes. It stays. And then it rots. And it stinks. And people are on these drugs, uh, they have a particularly rotten, stinking bad breath. It's part of the nausea and vomiting stuff. It makes, makes it more effective to have a stinking, rotting stomach. Anyway, uh, so that's what they're doing. Is they're adding an effective treatment, which is highly profitable, highly promoted to a dietary approach that's never worked well. I remember that Weight Watchers, their best bragging rights were at two years, the average weight loss was six pounds. Six pounds in two weeks, two years. You know, they, there may be other data out there, but that's, that's what I recall. So, you know, to keep business, they've got to get in the trend. What I was going to say is, is bariatric surgeons are doing the same thing. I see it in my medical literature. They are starting to make routine the addition of these GLP-1 semiglutides, the Ozempic, Wegovy, these type of drugs is a part of the usual management. The American Academy of Pediatrics just came out what, two months ago and said that we can start doing surgery on kids when they're 13 and we can start them on these drugs at age 12. This is you know, this is common practice, but is it right? Is it, you know, you, you're old enough to remember a time, a half a century ago, when the entire population of Asia, you couldn't find a single overfat, overweight person. Unless, of course, you looked at the sumo wrestlers who weren't on the Asian diet. So as 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 few years as account for your lifetime and your ability to look around and observe, you've seen 
immunity of obesity to people who eat starch-based diets partially disappear. Why? Because they gave up their starch-based diets. And now we're in a situation where 80% of people are overweight or obese. Why? Because pretty much 100% gave up their starch-based diets. So what should we do for our children, for ourselves? Should we look at the observation of eating starch and being trim and not having heart disease and breast cancer, colon cancer, constipation? Should we look at the food? Excuse me, where's the money? Where's the money? I don't see any money doing that. This is not a conspiracy, ladies and gentlemen. This is just money. Nobody wants to hurt you. You know, if, if what the intention was was to cause harm to you and your family, then it wouldn't be the situation where the person who works for the drug company or the dairy farmer or the, the, the butcher, it wouldn't be, it would be a situation where their families would be healthy and yours would be sick. That'd be the conspiracy. They'd go, hey, don't eat that meat. Don't eat that cheese. Look at those people around us. We got this extra special knowledge so we can keep our family healthy. Excuse me, the dairy farmer is fat. The wife has got diabetes and breast cancer. If they're making their own family sick, you know, it's, it, can't, it can't be a, cons a conspiracy. It's just ignorance and the desire to pay the bills. And it's not just paying the bills. It's, you know, owning a mansion, having three Teslas in your garage. Thank you, Dr. McDougall. Our next question is from Susie. And she says that she was diagnosed with PSC, primary sclerosing cholangitis. And mm -hmm. that um, what are your thoughts on the on PSC and diet, she said ulcerative colitis since 2005, started eating a whole food plant-based diet in November, 2021, able to get her colitis in remission, but not this rare liver disease that often coincides with inflammatory bowel disease. Liver specialist said that diet has no effect on PCS. And just because my ulcerative colitis is in remission doesn't mean my PCS will. They're saying there's no cure. She's taking a prescription called Ursodiol to thin her bile, and it seems to be helping with symptoms of itching, but there's nothing I can do to slow or stop the progression and may eventually need a liver transplant. She was hopefully mm -hmm. had tips like him, like maybe to cut out gluten or you know, any advice on this rare condition. Well, uh, you know, I, I would imagine that this happened in the following stages. She has an autoimmune disease. And once you have one autoimmune disease, you're much likely to have another one. So for example, people who have uh, celiac disease, they have a higher risk of rheumatoid arthritis, higher risk of, risk of uh, autoimmune thyroiditis, also the colitis, everything. So if you have one, one problem that indicates that you don't have an intact gastrointestinal tract and a fully functioning immune system, in other words, you have a body that's now attacking itself, then you end up with a whole bunch of problems because it attacks the whole body. So it attacked, in this case, it attacks a woman's colon and attacked her liver. Uh, I've told you just too many times, and I'll say it one more time, is you get these autoimmune diseases by eating foreign proteins. Okay, so using that analogy, when you eat foreign intestines, they call those tripe, don't they? Is that pig intestine is tripe or maybe it's cow? A tripe, I think it's T-R-I-P-E, tripe, right. Yeah. So you guys eat that stuff. So you eat it, swallow it, goes into your bloodstream, body says, hey, that's intestinal tract. But I think there's a problem here. It looks to me like cow intestinal tract or pig intestinal tract. I think this could be a problem. So it makes antibodies to this foreign intestinal tract like it would to a virus or a bacteria. And it, as, it's, as it's hunting around for this foreign intestinal tract, you know, that leads to colitis, ulcerative colitis and Crohn's. It's, it huts around and it finds your own intestines and it starts attacking them. The same thoughts when it comes to liver. Any of you ever eat liver? Well, I'll bet you, I'll bet you have, I'll bet you have. But if you haven't, and if you don't think you have, you have, because they throw the liver of these cows and pigs and your sausages and your hot dogs, et cetera. So you've eaten it. So the same kind of story. All right, so she got her ulcerative colitis better. That's good. She does. She has an autoimmune disease to the, to the liver ducts. That's the cholangitis. Uh, 
you know, it's progressed to the point where she's having an elevated uh, urea uh, byproducts, products of protein metabolism. Uh, BUN level is high. Uh, she's got to break, break down products of protein because that's what the liver does. It breaks down the protein. And when it doesn't do that, uh, fragments of protein end up in the bloodstream, which causes terrible itching. The drug you're taking, I'd have to look it up, but I imagine what it does is just reduces the amount of, of these, uh, uh, these protein breakdown products in your blood, which causes the itching. Urea, there's, there's a good, it probably reduces urea which is a, a byproduct of protein metabolism in a diseased liver. So that's what that drug does is it takes care of the itchy part of the disease, which is the buildup of urea and other nitrogen products, but it doesn't do anything to make the, uh, the, the bile or the, the liver ducts work any better. You know, maybe they're shot, maybe they're gone. I mean, you know, maybe they're so diseased by the time she changed her diet that there was no hope for complete reversal. I don't know. Getting down to the answer to the question, is there any more that you can do? Yes, there is. Yes, there is. Well, one thing you do is you can make sure you don't eat a, a high protein foods like beans, peas, and lentils. That'd be smart. Uh, instead, you consume things like sweet potatoes. All right, beans, peas, and lentils, 30% of their calories are protein. Sweet potatoes, it could be as low as 3%. So say you need 3% of your calories as protein, which is probably what you need to replace hair and skin. 3% of your calories is protein. Okay, you've done, you've taken care of all the duties protein has to take care of. What happens to the other 27% if you eat a lot of beans? You already, you already replaced all your hair and your skin and intestinal cells. You're not growing anymore. What do you do with the other protein, the 27% of the calories that are protein? What are you going to do with it? Got to go someplace, got to do something. Well, what happens to it is it's metabolized in the liver and then it's filtered to the kidneys and it's lost in the urine. That's what happens to it. So if you've got a diseased liver, then that protein load is going to make you itch and make you sicker in general. In fact, you may even end up going into a coma. It's called hepatic coma. You're sleeping. You don't, can't, they can't wake you up. Interesting study that I published in my June 2000, June 2000 newsletter. Okay. It's uh, about the liver being your savior. June of 2000, excuse me, June of 2002. June of 2002 is where the article is on liver. What it talks to you about, it gives you one article, which I wrote about back then, which is 30 years ago. That tells you that when you take liver patients, and you change their protein source from animals to plants, they wake up. In other words, they proved back then 30 years ago that plant protein was much easier to metabolize by the liver than animal protein. So you're gonna, you're gonna focus on eating a lower protein diet. You're gonna make sure it's all plant protein. Starch is where you get the pl plenty of protein, but plenty of calories too. In fact, you might even add some sugar to your diet. Why would you add sugar to your diet? White sugar, no protein, no potassium, nothing. Why would you add sugar? Well, because you need calories. I bet this person is very trim. You need to have calories. So adding a couple of tablespoons of sugar to your oatmeal in the morning is going to give you calories without protein. So you pick sweet potatoes, or you know, probably rice and corn and you know, don't get into beans, peas, and lentils. And, uh, you know, maybe add some sugar to your diet to get calories without protein. So that's how you can help with the, uh, with the buildup of nitrogen products and this drug you're taking likewise. Yeah, it likely deals with urea. Again, I'd have to look it up. Uh, yeah, liver, plant, 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 tra liver transplant may be the best hope you have. Because I suspect, you know, back when you had the ulcerative colitis, you did enough damage to your liver so that here, what, 10, 20 years later, you're, you're in trouble. And thank goodness they have liver transplants. They'll save your life. We need these people. But as a last resort, not a first, I'm sure you're, you and your doctors are delaying the transplant for a whole bunch of reasons. You have to be on immunosuppressant drugs the rest of your life. You know, these livers are not easy to get. 
So it, your goal is to delay this transplant for as long as possible. One goal, that's one goal. Another one is when you do go to surgery, you be the best surgical candidate possible. It, for a surgeon to delve through six, 10, 12 inches of body fat is not a good way to start an operation. You know, I, I spent, I, I told many of you in the past, I, I spent uh, probably six years as a surgical nurse. That's how I put myself through medical school. I worked in an operating room. I've been on thousands of surgeries. I've been on liver transplants. Uh, maybe not, maybe not. But liver, liver surgeries, I've been on many of them. But uh, we didn't have a transplant team at this hospital. But I've, I've certainly been in, in many abdomens. And I, I can tell you that when, when we see a, a person come in with an extra 100 pounds of body fat, we know this is going to be difficult surgery. The anesthesiologist looks at you at the same way. My goodness, this person is high risk of dying from anesthesia because they're so out of shape, they're so overweight. So get yourself in a condition where you uh, are the best operative candidate. And again, you know, go to the go to the doctor, trim. So they don't have to cut through any more than say a quarter inch of fat. That's what would happen if I had to have surgery. They'd go and go, wow. look at this guy. I'd probably be a great candidate for heart surgery, but guess what? I changed my diet when I was in my 20s which is another story. I'm 76 now. I do pretty much everything I want to do. Yep, that's great. Thank you. So the next question is from Anonymous. Would you talk about type 1 diabetes and weight loss difficulties? My daughter, 17, was diagnosed two years ago and has had difficulty losing weight, but her A1C numbers are good. She's only taking... Uh, insulin lantus at night. And that'd be a great person. Uh, is, is 17 too young to take your program, Dr. McDougall? You have another one coming up. No, absolutely not. 17 year olds take the program with no parental supervision. When somebody's like six, eight, 10, which we do have, then they need mom and dad there to help. Oh, no, we take care of her. The reasons that she's overweight is because, well, two reasons. One is she's still on the Western diet. She's getting tons of fat in her food, vegetable or animal fat. I don't care. Doesn't matter. And uh, the second of all, she's likely taking too much insulin. She's trying too hard to control her blood sugar levels. You know, uh, teenagers, particularly teenage girls who have type 1 diabetes, they found out the way to manipulate their weight is just to cut back on their insulin. Insulin moves fat into the fat cells. So if you if you need like 40 units of insulin a day and you take 20, whoa, you're going to get some rapid weight loss. You're not going to be seriously hurt. You know, it's not a really dangerous thing to do, or certainly not a recommended thing to do. But if you cut your insulin in a half as a teenager, you're going to be a one trim lady pretty quick. You can be at the point where you're going to have to add insulin back to keep from losing more weight. But in the meantime, you'll lose the weight. And like I say, a lot of teenage girls in particular have found this is the way that they're going to control their body weight. They're going to cut back in their insulin. So what I would ask mom and daughter to do is to really evaluate whether or not we're getting into an over-insulin treatment program. Is she taking more insulin than she needs? I bet that's the case. But you can figure that out. What blood sugar level should you be aiming for? 150 milligrams per deciliter. That's your target, no lower. Why? Because if your target is lower than that, you're going to gain weight. Why? If your target is lower than that, you're likely to have hypoglycemic reactions and kill yourself or your friends around you. So 150 is a good, a good level to aim for. And uh, make sure you get all the fats and oils out of your diet. The fat you eat the fat you wear. Vegetable fat paralyzes insulin as much as does animal fat. I just gave a presentation on Saturday. I hope you, you joined us. A presentation on diabetes that really put it together nicely, uh, flowed from one area of discussion to the next. And I'm, I'm really proud of that lecture. There's a series of lectures that we're giving right now. It uh, started with weight loss and then went on to diabetes. And next Saturday is going to be heart disease. After that will be cancer. And then after that will be a general nutrition talk. I originally wanted to put these get lectures together to educate my colleagues to teach them about diet therapy. And I don't know whether I'm ever gonna to get to be able to do that. 
because there's so little acceptance for what I do in the general medical business. They won't argue with me. They won't criticize me publicly or in writing. But behind the back, there's a lot of stuff that goes on, which basically says, you know, you're, this is not standard medicine. You know, standard medicine is based around drugs. I, and I'm not doing that. That's right. I'm not, I am not doing that. I'm the doctor who takes people off drugs. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. I'm the doctor who takes people off drugs. You better know it. Sick people take drugs. My patients get well. They don't take as many drugs or maybe none. I don't take any drugs. Mary doesn't take any drugs. Heather doesn't take any drugs. My guess is AJ doesn't take any drugs. Or neither do most of you. Sick people take drugs. My job as a doctor is to help you get well, not to get drugged. But you tell me any of these therapies that help people get well. I can't think of any. I've never seen a person cured of high blood pressure by taking blood pressure pills. I've never seen anybody cured of diabetes by taking insulin or diabetic pills. And I've, I've been at this for 50 years. Don't you think I would have noticed one case published in the scientific literature of somebody being cured of their high cholesterol or diabetes, et cetera, artery disease by taking it? Never. So that's not the kind of medicine I practice. What I practice is just simple. In fact, that's the problem. It's too simple. It needs a pill to go along with it. Simple ways to get you to cure your problem. And at the beginning of this lecture, the first hour, I gave you uh, an understanding of how removing the cause of Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's is due to aluminum poisoning. You end up curing the patient in the sense that the disease doesn't progress as rapidly, or maybe not at all depending on the extent of therapy and the extent of disease. Okay, not in the sense that you're going to get the brain tissue that you have destroyed and is now scars, which are called senile plaques and neurofibril tangles and tau proteins. That's scar. That's the result. That's the garbage left over from the inflammation due to the attack on the brain from aluminum. That's not a cure to take care of the garbage that's left behind, which is what MABs do. Monoclonal antibodies. We just went through that. I'm not going to go through that with you again. But a removing the aluminum, which causes the damage, is a cure. And if the Journal of American Medical Association publishes my letter to the editor, they're going to leave the word cure in there. And hundreds of thousands of doctors are going to read my letter to the editor. I have I've had the Journal of American American Medical Association have published my letters before. You know, I get articles published in medical journals on occasion. But there's a good chance they're going to publish this. In fact, they wrote me back and pretty much indicated that they're considering it. Yeah, I, you know, she called out in two or three weeks, a letter from Dr. John McDougall, which points out something everybody should know. That is the monoclonal antibodies are dangerous with little effect and you can get better results by drinking silica water. I didn't say that in the letter. I didn't mention silica water. But I did mention defroxamine. So we'll see what happens. I'll tell you, I don't want to guess what will happen. I'm guessing what will happen is they'll do whatever they can to make sure nobody pays attention to the article. But just the fact that the Journal of the American Medical Association may publish it is big news. It's good news. Dr. McDougall, just for transparency, I do take one medication, thyroid, and I'm going to True North and maybe I'll be able to get off it, you know? No, you won't. I won't? No, you won't. Really? Even if I no. fast, I won't? Okay. You can fast and stand on your head and stick carrots in your ears. I can I can stand on my head, but okay. Well, I thought that maybe they could reduce it or something if I fast. Well, you know, let, let me tell you the thyroid thing, uh, AJ, is you lose your thyroid gland due to thyroid uh, autoimmune thyroiditis. You ask any doctor, you uh, really nine out of 10 will tell you that you have autoimmune thyroiditis and they'll I, I order thyroid antibodies on you, which shows the antibodies, you know, the immune system attacking your thyroid. Your thyroid gland is dead. Aww. Or at least half dead. <laughs> it's not going to grow back, Chef HA. 
All don't right. Be, I've, I've only been on the medicine like less than 10 years and I'm not on a very high dose. Well, all right. I know you have hope, but why not? It's, it's safe to stop the medicine completely as long as you check your TSH level within three weeks, three to six weeks. <laughs> There's no, no harm done. So the way that doctors, the doctors at True North may care for you is they may take you off all your thyroid medications. It's the only way you can tell whether you need it or not. There's no other test, no way you can tell. You take you stop the thyroid medication, and then you repeat the TSH level in about three weeks. The reason you have to wait three weeks is it takes three weeks before you clear your system of the active form of thyroid. Okay, the way it works is you're taking T4, which is the Synthroid. I hope, hope you're not taking cow and pig. You're of not a course vegan. not. I'm an ethical vegan. I take, you know, what's it called? Le levothyroxine, 75 so in my well, that's the kind I prescribe. Like, yeah. What you do is you stop taking that. Uh, you make sure you get your TSH level rechecked in three to six weeks. And if you need it, then you restart it. It's a safe, highly effective, non-toxic, cheap medication. You buy 90 pills at Walmart for $10. They don't even put it through your insurance because it's too much trouble. So, um, yeah, I think you ought to find oh, let, me, let me add a more positive note to what you say even though I don't think you can grow your thyroid gland back. What we observed in a sub-study of our 1,703 people was about 200 people. We had pre and post weak TSH levels on them. So we got their TSH when they came in, we got another TSH seven days later. We showed a one micro-international unit improvement in one week. People got better. Either that or their thyroid medication worked better. But we had about, about one micro-international. Remember, two is normal. That's what your goal is. It's two micro-international units of TSH. <clears throat> we were able to overall drop, drop the TSH values down by one micro-international unit. So diet has something to do with either the function of the native thyroid, in other words, what you make, or the thyroid that you take is out of the bottle. Uh, so maybe, 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 maybe you'll get what you're looking for, but I wouldn't count on it. Don't let it make or break your day. You know what? I don't want to, I mean, I'm doing so well. Maybe I won't even address that, but um, yeah. You know, you might as well, because I know you'd like to be drug free. I would hate to have to take any medication, but uh, so you might want to do it. It's perfectly safe to do as long as you're under supervision and you don't forget to get your TSH level done and make corrections based on that level. You, you want to hear something Same. interesting, Dr. McDougal? Because when I look at you with the beard, that reminds me, the reason I, I, I didn't want to go on medicine and I kept saying, no, 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 I'll do this naturally. I actually grew a white beard just like you. They called it Lanugo. And they said that was because of my hypothyroidism. When I took the medicine, the beard went away. Yeah, I talked about uh, something that I get asked a lot of on, sh on your show. I talked about last night because I also read a lot. And... Uh, you know, I, you probably heard me say I, I read medical journal articles and Mary reads novels. Once in a while, I give her a medical journal article to read, and once in a while, she gives me a novel to read. But I gave her this article yesterday because, you know, Mary's 77. And, uh, you know, she's worried about hair loss, although I can't see any hair loss on her head, not much on mine. I still got pretty good head of hair. I know, you're not pressed, but it doesn't matter. I'm happy that I have this much hair. Anyway, this was called uh, Female Pattern Baldness. There's an article on Female Pattern Baldness. I don't know what I can pull up. Let me see if we got here. If I do, I'll show it. Here it is. Okay, do I have the uh, control here? You should. I didn't change it in any way. Uh, All right, let's see. If we, let's yeah, see you if sure do. You sure have control. Uh, here it is. Here's the article I showed last night's show. Uh, this is that. the title. Here's the title. Here's the paper. It's out of menopause, published in, uh, uh, let's see, 2022. It's called The Prevalence of Female Pattern Hair Loss in Postmenopausal Women. So you might want to look this up. It was kind of a fun article. It addresses what you folks have asked me over and over again. And it, it tells you that what I've been explaining to you has got some real value to it. It talks about how hair growth is related to hormones, estrogen in particular. 
And anytime you change your hormones in life as a woman, uh, you have hair loss. Not, not You don't go bald. You have female pattern baldness. Like when you start your menstrual periods, you may lose some hair. Uh, if you got pregnant, you may lose some hair. You, and pregnancy ended, you may lose some hair. Started breastfeeding, lose some hair. Stop breastfeeding, lose some hair. Go through menopause, lose some hair. It's just cyclic. And whenever you change your hormones, and estrogen is very important when it comes to pre preserving uh, your hair. Anyway, so they looked at 200 postmenopausal women age. Can you see this okay? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I saw your oh, show last see night the, too. See the pictures there? This absolutely. is normal hair. You see, this is looking at the top of somebody's skull. Okay, and they classify as Lugu 1, Lugu 2, and Lugu 3. This is the pattern. You see the pattern of hair loss? What do you think, AJ? Can you see that? Yeah. You yeah. know, some people. You see, you see the more detailed picture right below that? See how you lose those hair follicles? Anyway, as you go on and you read this article, you'll find some things that we can act on. All right, let's see if I can get it to work here. All right, what they say here is that the prevalence of female pattern baldness in postmenopausal women is 52%. Okay, in other words, half of women by the time they get to menopause lose their hair. Yeah, right. So uh, that that's women who menopause a little later in life. In this study, the average age of menopause was 58. So these are the women who eat the Western diet. And then they listed populations of women who don't eat the Western diet and look at their incidence of female pattern uh, hair loss. You see that down there, kind of bottom left-hand corner, Asian studies, which found the prevalence of female pattern hair loss to be 12% or 8% or 10%, 12%. In other words, one fifth of what you have when you eat the Western diet. And the only correlation they found with the incidence of having female pattern hair loss was how fat you were. In other words, the more you weighed, the more likely you were to lose weight. Why? Because being fat changes your female hormones. Anyway, that paper's pretty cool, huh? Uh-huh. Yeah. IBMI and obesity were associated with higher prevalence of worsening of field pit is a female pattern hair loss in postmenopausal women. But that's the article I gave Mary to read yesterday because it was a question that comes up so often on our discussion is women worry about losing hair. Well, you don't lose your whole head of hair, but you know, you want to keep it down to a minimum. Why? How do you do that? How do you do that based on the paper I just showed you? You eat like women who have a low incidence of female pattern baldness or hair loss. Asian women, what do Asian women eat? Well, in the postmenopausal women you looked at here, 90% of them lived on white rice, excuse me, 90% of their diet was white rice. These, these, the postmenopausal women, these are women who were who are alive and well in 1980 when in China, 90% of the food came from white rice. And yet these women who were raised on that kind of diet have only a 10% chance of getting female pattern hair loss when they go through menopause. Whereas if you eat the Western diet, guess what? That's my interpretation of the study. I think that's pretty cool. But anyway, that shows you what I spend my time doing. Reading uh some people say that if they're not losing hair, but their their hairline starts receding as they get older. Uh -huh. Well, let's see. I I I, I don't know. Let's see if okay. I can get rid of this. Am I still sharing? No, I'm you're not sharing. not sharing anymore. It's just you. Oh, okay, good. Okay. I I I, I think whether you have hair loss as a man or a woman depends upon your diet. I've told you the story about when I lived in Hawaii. How uh, uh, this story is in a book called uh, the McDougal, McDougal Program, 12 Days to Dynamic Health, which some of you have. It's about hair loss. And it's a story about a doctor in Nava who wrote an article back in the 80s, which was published in the journal Dermatology Oncology. 
And what Dr. Inaba did is he noted that prior to World War II in Japan, there was no, no, no male pattern of hair loss. And then what happened is post-World War II, uh, as they changed their diet, which they did, and they got cancer, the breast and prostate and colon, heart disease and strokes of our kind, et cetera. What happened is male pattern bone loss, hair loss became common. And I was living in Hawaii then, and uh, I would go to Waikiki quite often, and I would look at the Japanese tourists, and the elderly Japanese male always had a full head of hair. Whereas the residents of Japanese descent who were raised in Hawaii on the American diet, they were as bald, and as greasy, and as overweight as blacks or whites. So, you know, what you eat has a tremendous effect on how you appear, not just your body fat, not, not just how you smell or stink or greasy hair or greasy face or the acne that follows. You know, you want to keep a good head of hair that looks younger. Women are more attractive to men who have hair than men who are bald. I can show you the research. What do you think of that, AJ? <laughs> I think it's true. I'm keeping my hair. Good. Dr. McDougall, you probably have a lot to say about this topic, but um, a question was sent in. Can you talk about whether or not people should take an omega-3 supplement because Dr. Clapper has changed his opinion and is yeah. now taking them? No, I don't recommend it. I think it's, 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 it's not the right move. I, I don't know whether I need to go in any greater detail than that. Uh, Dr. Clapper is somebody I have great respect for and have been his friend for half a century. He's my age. And when you get to be my age, you know, things seem to count more in terms of uh, every little thought that you forget. You know, you, say, you think to yourself, well, here's common Alzheimer's or any little, uh, any little problem you have, you know that's a sign of old age and you're failing. And so uh, I have those kinds of thoughts and I look around for, ways to keep my youth and my functionality. And, you know, supplements are, have an appeal because the supplement industry advertises to death their products, even though they don't work. And I can show you two major studies, review studies. In fact, we presented them on this show because another one of your guests sells these supplements. And I gave you two articles to hand out to people. I don't know if you still have them available, uh, Chef AJ, but but show that uh, omega-3 fats don't prevent Alzheimer's. So you can believe the research, you can believe the advertisements, it's up to you. Anyway, uh, I suspect that uh, Dr. I suspect, I'm pretty sure Dr. Clapper wants to keep his functionality and youthful appearance as long as possible, just like I do. But uh, taking free fatty acids or omega-3 fats, I don't believe is a wise thing to do. Uh, why is it not a wise thing to do? Well, for a lot of you, the problem would be the omega-3 fats, the flaxseed oil, the fish oil, et cetera, is going to be fat that you wear. Well, Dr. Clapper doesn't have a weight loss issue, so he's not worried about it. If you're diabetic, these omega-3 fats, they've been tested giving omega-3 fat supplements to people with diabetes, type 2 and type 1. Your diabetes gets worse. It gets as bad if you take animal fat as vegetable fat. It paralyzes the insulin activity. So even at a subclinical level, if you're going to take these, these uh, omega-3 fats, even if you don't have frank diabetes, you're not helping your, your insulin system, your regulation system. You're doing harm. And then the other problem is, you end up with greasy hair and greasy skin. That's not attractive either. The fat you eat is the fat you wear. That's not attractive either. Uh, studies on cancer. I can show you studies where adding flaxseed, you know, the good kind of omega-3 fat, adding flaxseed oil increases cancer growth tremendously to where if you feed the flaxseed oil to experimental animals, I know, I know, and I agree with you. I'm not fighting with you on these kind of experiments. When you feed uh, omega-3 flaxseed, flaxseed oil, fish fat, to 
experimental animals, you increase the volume of their tumors by as much as a thousand fold. No, I would take, I would take omega-3 fats. And besides that, you must realize that all omega-3 fats come from plants. I don't need any concentrated oil in my diet. Uh, if I wanted oily skin and oily hair, if I wanted to make my control of my blood sugar worse, if I wanted to increase my risk of cancer, I might do it. But I want to do those things. And uh, the fraud in the omega-3 uh, snake oil sales pitches is huge. These people are lying to you because they want to sell supplements. That's what I think. Dr. McDougall, where can we find the article that flaxseed oil increases cancer? And is it the same for whole flax seeds? Because a lot of people are putting a half a cup of flaxseed. It's not the same for whole flaxseed. Okay. It's in uh, my, if you go to Hot Topics under cancer, you'll find the article. Okay, thanks. Okay, it's uh, something you think, I, I can look it up. Okay, no, but but you're saying it's not the same, even if people take a whole half a cup no, of flaxseed. Flaxseed flax seed, not the same thing. It's only the oil. It's only it's the oil. Uh, so it's okay to put a half a cup of flaxseed in a smoothie? Well, I don't know. I, I don't do it. I wouldn't recommend it. See, uh, the um, let me find that article because I know you're all interested. In it. Yeah. Uh, no, I, I don't think you should do it. I think if eating flaxseed, we used to serve flaxseed on our program to help people with their balls. You, you don't see my slideshow here, do you? Uh, not yet. Good. Well, don't look at it. Okay. I'm putting up a whole bunch of stuff I don't want you to look at. It. All right. Uh, Did you want to share anything on the screen? Was no, I don't know yet. Okay, let me know. I'll let you know. No, I'll, I'll let you know. Okay, you want to take another question? I mean, no, the, no, let's the, take another question. Some of these are going all the way back to March because I know we didn't see you last month. Uh, this is from Cheryl, and she says, "Dr. McDougall, wheat, barley, and rye make me depressed, and when I eat whole grains, I feel like someone punched me in the stomach. I'm also sensitive to soybeans and pulses, which make me feel bloated. How can I still eat a starch-based diet? Is a starch-based diet right for me?" Yeah, I eat potatoes. Sweet potatoes. Don't eat the grains. Yeah. No, well, that's what I figured you'd say. I don't eat any beans and I haven't. Oh, uh... well, we got another thyroid question uh, from Penny. If changing your, uh, if she, I, we, you covered this with me coincidentally, but she said, if changing your diet 100%, should we stop taking Armour Thyroid and go to synthetic T3 medication or will we no longer need a a thyroid hormone medication. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You should uh, take only the centroid. Yeah. Don't and take the reason is mm -hmm. trying to find this article. The reason is is uh is the armor thyroid, they're called glandulars. They're made from the thyroid glands of cows and pigs. So yeah. This isn't a question, but this is from a, a, a viewer who wrote in because they didn't know how to contact you named Matthew. And he said, would you ever give a lecture specifically about children and the health issues they suffer from, from the standard American diet? If you look at my uh, website, you'll find I've given a lecture on children and a lecture on pregnancy. Pregnancy is in my January, 2011 newsletter. And, uh, uh, children, uh, you'd have to look at various newsletters. I did this one. Uh, the children are our future. It's found under hot topics. Children, nutrition and children. So I, I will have to, to find this article this way for you. On omega-3 fats somehow. And that's not coming up as easy as I thought it would be. That's okay. You can keep looking. I'll keep asking questions yeah, until, yeah, you, until you tell me to stop. Um, Leah says, Dr. McDougall, what causes high cholesterol and in particular low HDL and high EDL with somebody who's been plant-based for decades, mostly low fat, 
and last six months under 20 grams of fat, no overt fats. Uh, she's 58, 5'5", 135, cholesterol 191, HDL 45, LDL 119, otherwise blood stuff is normal. Oh, I don't know. I don't know where she started with cholesterol. She tell me what her cholesterol was six years ago. No, nope, she didn't. No, well, you know, maybe, maybe with her initial change in diet, she got a drop in cholesterol. And that, you know, she went from 300 to 200 or 191 or whatever she said. You know, I'd have to know where she started as to how much benefit I would say she she's getting. But people worry about low HDL, like when they have low cholesterol and we don't have to worry about it, right? When our total cholesterol is low, because I always hear that if you don't have garbage, you don't need garbage trucks and HDL are the garbage trucks. Well, uh, HDL, it, HDL is, I, I can't pay attention to two things. I'm pretty good, but not that good. <laughs> H, HDL, the thing is, HDL is just one, one fraction of total cholesterol. So when you drop total cholesterol, you drop you reduce HDL cholesterol. So one of the ways to make your good cholesterol go up is to eat steak. You know, the more cholesterol you eat, the higher your HDLs will become because HDL is only a fraction of total cholesterol. So um, I don't know. Uh, I, I don't. I don't think you should pay attention to HDL cholesterol. In fact, the lecture I'm giving next Saturday talks about how you should only pay attention to total cholesterol. That's it. The other, otherwise, everything's too confusing. Nice. So. Thank you. Um, this is about rheumatoid arthritis from Carla. She's trying to follow the McDougall plan. Do you think taking probiotics are a good idea? There's some research, particularly out of England, that shows that it's very helpful to take probiotics. And you'll have to look it up, and you can easily do it. Look up vegetarian diet and rheumatoid arthritis. And you'll find any, uh, a group in London has done a lot of work on this. They put people on vegan diets, but they also take the trouble to feed them probiotics to make sure their microbiome is so set up well. Uh, I've not been a real believer in that. Uh, I think the diet's enough for most people. You don't, it'll, your, your microbiome will naturally change. Yeah. Yep. Do you like those, all those new microbiome testing they're doing? No, it's it's a it's another business, AJ. Yeah, um, you're looking at uh, anyway. Let, let me stop doing this because I'm not getting any place. Uh, yeah. What was the question again, AJ? About um the the, the microbiome testing that's the rage oh, now. Microbiome, the whole microbiome thing is that, and they're sold as prebiotics and probiotics. Prebiotics are sugars that bacteria like to eat, good bacteria like to eat these sugars. And uh, uh, they have to be the same sugars that are made by plants, no coincidence. All right, I'm back. Anyway, uh, the bacteria that live in your colon depend upon what kind of food you have for them. So if you're gonna eat animal foods like you know, dairy and chicken and beef and pork and so on, you're going to grow bad bacteria because that's what bad bacteria eat. They eat these animal foods. And they're going to hamper your immune system. They're going to make carcinogens. Uh, you know, it, you don't want bad bacteria growing in your intestinal tract. So if you change the food from animal foods that you eat to plant foods, then what will happen is the bad guys will die out and the good guys will come in. Now you say, well, that's not the whole story. No, it's not the whole story, but it's enough of the story for you to get things worked out as far as your bacteria and your colon go. The addition of that story would be that I would like to, if I'm going to start growing good bacteria, so I'd like to harbor in my intestinal tract bacteria that are associated with the least chance of getting disease the least chance of breast cancer, prostate cancer, colon cancer, heart disease, obesity, diabetes. I mean, what population of people around the world have the lowest incidence of these diseases? Well, one population is rural Africans. They're basically immune to all these problems. I would like to eat, grow in my colon, the kind of bacteria that rural Africans have growing in their colon. I mean, they already eat the McDougal diet, rural Africans do. But to get that spectrum of bacteria, I'd have to eat African feces. 
which by the way, I wouldn't be surprised if they start selling pretty soon is, uh, I don't know, but they won't advertise it as feces, but it'll be basically feces so that you can get the bacteria that are uh, associated with the least chance of disease. But then you got to feed them right. Because if you don't feed them starches, vegetables, and fruits, they're going to go away. Then you got to go get more African poop. <laughs> but, but I, if had, you, if, I, had, I had a lady on yesterday that was from the Ivory Coast, and she's a plant-based educator now. And she said, even, even in her country of origin, if people, there's McDonald's and they're getting fat and sick. Oh, it's now. terrible. Yeah. Terrible what goes on. So... I, anyway, I probably should cut, knock it off because I'm okay. Know, I'm, I'm, All right, I'm past the point of ta- ta- paying good attention to you. Okay, well, just what about the one that I was saving for Mary? Did she want to come? Because there was one. Well, what, is the, what is that question? It was about Mary's mini. I saw. Oh, why don't you come and uh, talk to her? Yeah, it was just about if, if a person named um, Cindy was asking she, about Mary's mini. She'd be glad to show up just to show you she's okay. doing well today. Oh, yeah. All right, Mary, go ahead. Hi, Mary. Hi. 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 How you doing? I hear you. I'm good. good. I'm, I can't I'm wait to see you. Can't wait to see you next month in Palm Desert. It's oh been, yeah, that was fun. It's been four years since I saw you guys. The last time was at Benji Kurtz event in somewhere in Washington, I believe. That was the November right before the pandemic. So uh, Cynthia's trying the Mary's Mini. And she said, I know there's a 50-50 rule. I don't know if you said there was a 50-50 rule. She says, is weight a good way to do it? I mean, she showed me a picture of a scale where she's weighing her food. But she said she picked organic honey gold potatoes. Um, but then it sounds like she's picking a variety of vegetables, green broccoli, spinach, arugula, kale, garlic, onions, and mushrooms. My understanding is you pick one. And she wants to know, is it okay to add sauces to it, like yummy sauce? Well, that, that's a whole bunch of questions. I mean, basically, your main diet should be starch. That's where all of your calories should come from in one starch, either potatoes or rice or sweet potatoes or corn or, you know, not a combination of all of them, one of those starches. And then to that, you may add some green and yellow vegetables that have been cooked. Not a whole variety of them, just, you know, beans and broccoli and a few other things. And sauces, no, because you can actually make a high fat gravy and a high fat other thing, you know, things like salsas and um, uh, vegetable type sauces that don't have a lot of calories that are just um made as a condiment maybe depending on what's in them um i think we used some salsa on our baked potatoes when we were doing the 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 mary's mini but um you know not not a whole lot of gravies and things like that the sauce she was thinking has some uh beans it's made out of beans and there's a few dates in it nope I would say no to that for sure. That's not Ma- that's not Mary's mini. That probably yeah. wouldn't even be maximum weight loss. Yeah, and there's no need for her to weigh and measure her food, right? Oh no, oh no, never. Just just put it on your plate and eyeball it. Right. Great. Well, thank you. When do you guys get into Palm Desert? Are you going to stay for the whole conference or just come for your Sunday award? You know, I. I don't think we really have decided yet, AJ. We were talking yesterday about buying tickets and we haven't done that yet. So, uh, you know, I really don't know, but we'll be there. Well, I'm excited. Is the whole family coming? Um, Part of the family. So, I mean, Heather will be there and probably Jason and Craig and um, maybe his wife, Mika. But um, I'm not sure who else. Well, and people will be very happy to see you, I'm sure. They're, I just heard that they're going to honor Dr. Hans Deal a little bit at the very beginning. Oh, they are? Okay. Yeah, they're going to do something. Okay. Well, thank, thank you guys so much.
Okay, I'm going to show you this. Okay, you write it down or make your make your um, whatever. Put your pause button on. I'm going to show you the research papers. There are four of them that show an increase in metastases associated with and cancer growth associated with um, with consuming flaxseed oil and other omega three fats. Okay, so here it is. Let's put it up. Here are the studies. I think I couldn't find them, right? <laughs> there you go. You see it? Yep. All right. You just can go back, watch this lecture, go to the end of the lecture, put it on pause. Here they are for you. Uh, they're the ones that are outlined there. Let's make them bigger for you. And I don't want you to miss any of them. <laughs> There's the, there's the articles you look up. You can see they indicate that uh, these omega-3 fats aren't good for you, don't they? Dietary omega-3 fats promote colon cancer, carcinogenesis, metastasis in a rat, okay? That means causes them to grow. Promotion of colon cancer metastasis in rat liver by fish oil is not due to reduced stroma. That's another one. Uh, it affects the fish oil and corn oil diets on, anyway, suppressor of immune systems. There's another one. Here's another, I should, should give you four articles. Look them up. And if you can't find them easily on at the National Library of Medicine, I showed you how to find these articles. Remember I showed you? We're gonna end with this. The way you find these articles, you get to have them yourself is this. Write it down, I'm gonna tell you how to do it. You go to the National Library of Medicine. All right, you should be able to find that easily. You enter in the title of the article into their search engine, or you can list the citation that's given to you right there. And they're going to come up with a digital object identifier, a DOI. Okay, you take that DOI number and you put it into a website called uh, SciHub, S-C-I-H-U-B. Okay, you wrote this down. You go to the National Air Medicine and you go to SciHub and you drop the DOI number into the search engine of SciHub, S-C-I-H-O-B. And likely every one of these articles will appear for you. Info. H-U-B. H-U-B, what did I say? H-O-B. Oh boy, <laughs> it's been too long. S-C-I-H-U-B. -S you could probably go through and correct the rest of this lecture I gave for the last two hours, Mary. No, I think everything else was good. All right. Anyway, you can pull out the whole article. You can decide whether you like it or don't like it. There's the research. And I bet you can find a ton more because I haven't looked into this for quite a while. Uh, a ton more of articles. All, all you do is you look up related articles. It, it tells you about them in the National Library of Medicine. So I bet I can I could complete this uh, this list of citations. Probably end up giving you twenty or thirty articles that show that polyunsaturated fats. You should just read this whole article. Oh, you could. Let's see if I cut off. No, nah, I don't have it here. Oh, you don't have it all in here. Okay. Right. Anyway, there you go. There it is. Look it up. Thanks, AJ. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. McDougall. Thank you, Mary. Look forward to seeing you next month, both um, on the show and in Palm Springs. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back tomorrow at 1 p.m. Pacific time for Feeling Great and Listen, Nate. We're going to ask all your questions about the wraps. Take care.